hello again, fellow Bible nerds. So we went over a lot of content the last couple. Let's see. Hold on. Mic issues. Okay, we're good. We went through a lot of information in the last couple videos. This one is going to sort of connect all of the dots and show how this is transferred from these ancient pictographs into and melded into our modern world. And once you see it and you make that connection, you will never be able to unsee it. And that in and of itself will verify that this connection is accurate. You walk around after you see this, your eyes will be completely opened. I do have two things I need to start with. Um, I had one good friend ask me from as a response to the first video um, when I was talking about how Jesus' arm is not too short to save, but if we continue sinning, um, we're separated from him. And she asked the question, are you saying that if you keep making mistakes and keep messing up, then you can't be atoned for? Um, which is a great question, and I just want to publicly answer that as a resounding no. Um, Jesus also told the parable of you shall forgive your brother 70 times 7, and how much more does he forgive us? And that's kind of the whole reason for all of this. It's because he has forgiven us so many times where we're going, okay, I don't want to do this anymore because I don't want to have to go through another cycle of this um, repentance, uh, backsliding, sin, repentance game. It should be, let's just pursue him completely. And it's the, when you know something is wrong, that's when he stops mm -hmm. Uh, atoning for it he says whenever you're done doing that i'll i'll forgive you but you can't sit here and commit adultery over and over and over and tell me you love me well and on that thread um on the other side of repentance is freedom don't we want that and so these and we'll explain this but these um traditions are holding us captive they're holding our hearts captive our families our relationship with our God, our money, they're holding our lives captive. So don't we want freedom? And also as a segue to that, again, I'll reiterate that as we present stuff, it's perfectly normal for you to be upset, angry, pissed off even. And if you do, I just ask you to ask where that's coming from. And I get it. I was mad for years yes. after finding this stuff out, and it's been a slow dawning for me. Uh, and again, this is when you're learning this stuff, you're not um, getting punished or like God's not angry at us. We don't if know. We, we were lied to. Hidden. We've he, been lied to. So, um... He's angry at the people that lied to us and yeah. have hidden this because every single time element of it every facet has been purposely hidden by the serpent yeah. and he's been using humanity as his shield this whole time and all yeah. we have to do is step out of the way so god can judge the serpent in no way too are we discrediting your faith um so it's actually th these lies have been built upon people's want and desire to, to honor god, god and worship absolutely. god so they've they've hijacked that that drive to be godly people and to carry out what he taught you. Mm -hmm. But the festivals that they have told you he wanted, he specifically spends the entire Bible saying, I don't want these. Mm -hmm. So this is about realigning that love for obedience and wanting to worship because he has a whole host of ways where he said he loves that worship. So why not apply the that desire to where he said he loves it mm -hmm. instead of having to fight and, and go back and forth. I think it's a lot easier to just figure out what he's told us and figure out why the serpent has told us the opposite. Because mm -hmm. uh, Sun Tzu famously said, if you know yourself and you know your enemy, you will never know defeat. And that's true in both a physical and a spiritual battle. This is a spiritual battle that we're in. And the only way that we will possibly come out victorious is if we know our enemy enough to avoid his tactics. Amen. 
So with that, we'll get into the celebrations of man's fall. You're going to have to click on the... There. <laughs> My tech wizard over here. So we'll return back to Revelation 17, 1 through 5. And I think that every time you read this, after each presentation, it should just be more and more vivid. Mm -hmm. It's every iteration like gives you more detail and your eyes are open to what specific things he's referring to. And this is all the end times judgment. So as your eyes are open to this in a spiritual and a factual sense, this next phase should show us in a truly visual sense what it means to have to see this thing. Mm -hmm. So uh, he's referring to the great prostitute who is seated on many waters, whom with, with whom the kings of the earth have committed sexual immorality, and with the wine of whose sexual immorality the dwellers on earth have become drunk. And he carried me away in the spirit into a wilderness, and I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast that was full of blasphemous names. And it had seven heads and ten horns. The woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet, and adorned with gold and jewels and pearls, holding in her hand a golden cup full of abominations and the impurities of her sexual immorality. And on her forehead was written a name of mystery, Babylon the Great, mother of prostitutes, and of earth's abominations." So the great harlot that we know of, just a quick uh, summary from the last couple videos, is this great harlot is prophetically symbolic of Asherah worship in general, but also it's symbolic of Asherah the goddess, and it's symbolic of the religions and the nations who worship Asherah. Mm -hmm. So it's a layered prophecy that melds into the physical and the spiritual, and all of the connections are circular. It her... connects all of the idols. So every she's the queen of heaven. She's the mother, mother of all goddesses. So in that, that includes the gods that are beneath her. Yeah. Uh, the celebration to the male dying god was primarily for combating Adam's curse, just as Asherah worship was in um, com competition with Eve's curse. And we also know that the idolatry of this great harlot will be present in modern times if it fits the end times prophecy. So we know that Asherah and Baal worship and those customs must be continued to be performed today. So as opposed to what history tells us, Baal and Asherah worship never died out. It just went under cover. Mm -hmm. it, it hid itself so that we couldn't see it anymore, which is exactly what a serpent does. Mm -hmm. It uh, it never went away. Everyone says that Christianity took over after the Roman period. But what they did was they melded these religions and these rituals with Christianity. They took the theology of Christianity and plugged it in with all of these images. And we'll prove in the next video that that's still not okay. It's just like the golden calf situation. So it's our job to identify that. And again, the culprit here is the serpent. We've been deceived all along, and God's just asking us to open our eyes and stop letting him deceive us. Mm -hmm. Amen. And free. He's trying to free us. So we, we went over this last time, but it's a good reiteration. Yes, for sure. So um, I'll just read the whole thing. You guys can skip ahead if we're boring. It was the <laughs> the 56th year of the life of Lamech when Adam died. 930 years old was he at his death, and his two sons, Enoch and Methuselah, his son, buried him with great pomp, as at the burial of kings. And note, there's nothing wrong with that great pomp. There's nothing wrong with the huge burial. Joseph had one of those as well. Mm -hmm. The problem is what happens afterwards. It says, in that place, all the sons of men made a great mourning and weeping on account of Adam. Again, nothing wrong with mourning for the dead. Especially he was the first man who's ever died. That's, mm -hmm. that's pretty traumatic. But it has therefore become a custom among the sons of men to this day. And Adam died because he ate of the tree of knowledge, he and his children after him, as the Lord God had spoken. And the whole point of this message is so that we can stop dying. Yeshua bought the contract 
to to stop this. All we have to do is enter into it and um, open our eyes to what we're doing. Mm-hmm. We're going to look at a couple cross references between the the festivals and the rituals and what they looked like. And then there's a side by side of the scriptural reference, and you'll like it's impossible to not see the similarity. It is yeah. almost creepy. The historic account is identical to scripture. And these people weren't Christians. These are coming from pagan um, or atheistic or just purely uh, scientific. scientific understanding so there's no interpretation here it's just the bible next to public record Mm -hmm. so ezekiel 8 14 through 15 again when he's breaking bringing him through the the temple and showing him the abominations and why he's leaving jerusalem and sending um assyria against it um he brought him into the gate of the Lord's house, which was towards the north. And behold, women were sitting there weeping for Tammuz. And he said to me, do you see this son of man? Yet you will see still greater abominations than these. And then Fraser in the Golden Bow has a parallel. At all events, we can hardly doubt that the day of blood witnessed the mourning for Addis slash Tammuz over an effigy of him, which was afterwards buried. The image thus laid in the sepulcher was probably the same which had hung upon the tree. You can just hit the next button. Jeremiah 10, 2 through 5. I'm sure all of you have seen this verse, and there are arguments flying all over the internet about what this verse actually means. Mm-hmm. This and trend... without this context, I mean, I could see how people would say, oh yeah, that doesn't mean that. That's vague. Not only the context, but most of your translations change this verse as well. Mm-hmm. So... People are reading this and going to the Bible, and their translation has changed the words and the definitions, and so of course they're going to come away with a different idea of what's being said. Mm-hmm. You have to take the final step of going to what the Hebrew said, and there's interlinear versions where you don't have to be a scholar to do that, but it'll show you the word-for-word uh, translation that doesn't have the, um, the NIV effect applied, and I'm sure that's been patented, but I'm using it. The NIV effect. The NIV effect. I love that. Okay, proceed. So anyway, um, what is it he starts Jeremiah 10 with is do not learn the way of the nations and don't be terrified by the signs of heavens. These, These rituals were all about trying to fix the broken nature. They were all about trying to use witchcraft and magic to empathetically and magically um, bring back the sun or bring back the vegetation and they thought that if they didn't sacrifice and kill their children and their their human adult slave sacrifices or their pig sacrifices, that the demons were going to destroy the world. Mm-hmm. So they're literally giving the demons exactly what they want. And the demons don't have the power to do this. So the whole thing is just a blood ritual that has us um, in a cycle of fear. Mm-hmm. But again, go into the, the specific Hebrew when it says the customs of the people are delusional, it is a tree he's cut from the forest, the work of a craftsman's hands with an axe. And I've seen translations that literally say um, it is uh, a tree that he cut from the forest, and then it gets really sneaky and goes a craftsman's um, or a woodworker's carving. Mm-hmm. It uses the word carving. Um, and so that immediately puts in your head oh, some kind of a. Or some kind of a statue. Mm -hmm. But the biblical word just says a workman with an axe. Mm -hmm. It's not even a craftsman. It's just a – there's a large list of um, professions that fall under that um, category. Um, There's woodworkers and there's metal workers and there's um, just cutters and then there's builders. So there's Mm -hmm. there's a a large collection – of words that fit but the axe is a specifier that says the workman is using an axe it's not it's, uh niv i believe even calls it a chisel so your your whole mental road goes the complete wrong direction and they do that on purpose they decorate it with silver and gold 
They fasten it with nails and hammers so it doesn't totter. Like a scarecrow in a cucumber field they are. They cannot talk and they have to be carried because they cannot walk. And then to add another little blip of detail, uh, Fraser's account of this day of blood is almost chillingly similar to this verse. And knowing that this is what was going on, of course Jeremiah is describing this ritual. He's not just making stuff up and and like word vomiting. He's explaining what they're doing at these rituals that he's seeing every single year. On the 22nd day of March, a pine tree was cut in the woods and brought into the sanctuary of Cybele, where it was treated as a great divinity. The duty of carrying the sacred tree was entrusted to a guild of tree bearers. The trunk was swathed like a corpse with woolen bands and decked with wreaths of violets. For violets were said to have sprung from the blood of Attis, as roses and anemones from the blood of Adonis. And the effigy of a young man, doubtless Attis himself, was tied to the middle of the stem. Identical. 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 In the comments, guess what movie? (laughs) Inside joke. So further, we may conjecture, though we are not expressly told, that it was on the same day of blood and for the same purpose that the novices sacrificed their virility. Wrought up to the highest pitch of religious excitement, they dashed the severed portions of themselves against the image of the cruel goddess. And this got cut out just because we had way too many slides. But uh, in addition to this, this was also the day where these priests would, they would, um, a graphic warning. Yeah. They would, after they emasculated themselves, they would run down the streets naked and they would throw their testicles in the door of some random house. Mm -hmm. And that random, uh, the owners of that house would have to furnish that man with a set of woman's clothing. For the rest of their lives. Which they would wear the rest of their lives and that was their priestly garments. And this is exactly what we're seeing today with all of the transgenders forcing people to call them by their chosen pronoun. Or the scientists, a.k.a. priests. Yeah, they're literally, the, the scientists are emasculating these men mm-hmm. surgically, and then they're using chemicals to uh, turn them into women, and then these men are forcing us to call them women, essentially donning women's garments for this priesthood of Baal. And just because they don't call it publicly the priesthood of Baal, doesn't mean the ritual isn't the, same. isn't the same. It's just, it's the modern variant and it shows you how powerful it's gotten where yeah. you're seeing it in your face every single day. Mm-hmm. So um, just to add, there were two rituals that they would do where one, they would throw the testicles into some the window of someone's house and then they would also throw the testicles at the pine tree in symbol of, uh, to symbolize Addis castrating himself under the pine tree. So if you think about it on a deep, spiritual, biblically grounded um, place, of course God is telling us not to do anything that resembles that because what it's doing is it's, it. it's reveling in that moment where we died. Yes. It's reveling in the fact that every single offspring that God got through Adam was already... Um, marred. Yes. God has been looking for a perfect offspring mm-hmm. since Adam, and Jesus was the only human that has ever been that. Yes. And that's because of this moment. So we're celebrating this moment instead of mourning and weeping over it. Mm-hmm. Amen. So this connection I brought up in the last video, mm-hmm. where we're seeing the the priests of Baal trying to compete with. Elijah. And I'll interject here. Uh, I want you to ask yourself, why Elijah? Because in, um, is it Micah, I believe? Um, Yeah, I believe it's Micah 4 or 5, where he says, before that great and terrible day of the Lord, he's sending Elijah. Mm -hmm. Why is he sending Elijah specifically? Mm -hmm. Um, This question was in in my goal it for years Mm -hmm. going like there's there's Samuel and there's Nathan and there's Mm -hmm. David and there's Moses why specifically Elijah what is it that Elijah did that is going to be needed in the last days and that led this whole study and this was his ministry 
ministry was calling out this evil. That was his ministry. And we'll get into that in the last one. But the whole Elijah story is this competition between Baal and Asherah where Elijah's saying, no, my God is a living God. Mm -hmm. This is all fake. It's all lies. Um, so we're, we're seeing the priests whirling about, dancing, waggling their heads and streaming hair, gashing their bodies. Um, I think it's interesting in first Kings, it actually says they would cut themselves according to their custom. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're seeing a specific, it actually says that was normal for them. That's a purposeful, um, factual interjection. When you look at the historical account, it just goes to further prove the biblical accuracy of it. Mm -hmm, absolutely. So everything's cross-checking and looking more accurate and more in focus here. Mm -hmm. Yes. So to prove out some more similarities, when Jehu went to um, confront Jezebel, he yelled from outside, who is on my side? And two or three eunuchs looked down at him. So it was a normal thing the if you remember the priests of Baal um, oh, the priests of... when it with Elijah they wiped out the priests of Baal but yes. the priests of Asherah stayed with Jezebel yes so and they called her then Jezebel's eunuchs because she was the living embodiment of the Asherah which was common practice in the Near East that the the queen of that time and Cleopatra herself she followed this where she would even have hieroglyphs made of herself in the image of Isis so this is not like a stretch in, of the imagination at all Proceed. okay um, so yeah this is normal and the Bible again is just proving this connection and the historical accuracy of it all mm -hmm. so at this point you'll probably guess that this is about Christmas Ta-da! Surprise! <laughs> Big shocker. Yeah, don't Big reveal. <laughs> so I'm going to turn it over to Anna because she did more of the research and more of the um, compiling of this than I did. And she's got a lot more of a testimony on Christmas itself because I didn't really have a background in it. And yeah. she's the one that's made major leaps. So this is more of her, her talk. Yeah, maybe I should. Okay, so I will start by saying I used to be, like, the biggest Christmas lover out of anybody I've ever known. So just putting that out there, I was so much obsessed with Christmas that I would listen to Christmas carols daily, all day. I loved Christmas carols. I would, um, my favorite thing in the whole wide world was putting up the decorations. I loved um, going to see Christmas lights. I loved all of it. And I, I even would paint, like temporarily dye part of my hair. It's like a semi-permanent. So it's like goes away in like a month. <laughs> Parts of my hair green so that it was red and green, people. I am not joking. I was like the most biggest lover of Christmas ever and he never really celebrated it he grew up not really celebrating it and when on our first date one of the first things I told him is I love Christmas I was like, All right, this and is never he was like work. this is never gonna work so people you were listening to like the like Christmas's number one ex fan like so just putting that out there that's my testimony but then once I saw this information because he had been compiling this for years, my, I, I just, it broke my heart because I just couldn't see how such violence and pain that has caused these people in history, they're people, they might just look like cartoon figures to us because it's hundreds of years past, you know, so there's less emotional attachment to people thousands of years ago but these people have suffered and been enslaved to these traditions for thousands of years and it's caused so much pain and suffering and child sacrifice and human sacrifice that 
I was like, how in the heck could that be something that Yeshua would, Jesus would celebrate and want to be celebrated in when our God, our Messiah is the one who sets captives free. And all of these traditions are about putting us in bondage as we will show you. So with that lens, I know if you are new to this and if this information is new to you, yes, this is shocking, but just try to peace, have relax your mind, listen to the information. Do not ignore it. Do not turn it off. Listen to the information, relax your heart and just let it settle. And if it makes you mad, that is fine. And if you reject it, reject it. Yes. It's, but hear the information. It. Take a look. Yeah. And test it, it yourself. Let your mind question. Yeah. And if you end up completely disagreeing, then completely disagree. Yes. Amen. Uh, all I ask is that you evaluate what we have in front of us for yourself. Yes. Okay. Let's go. So um, this is, so I have Christmas carols obviously right here. This is just a very interesting thing. Um, this is from very Fraser as well. <laughs> very interesting. These unsexed beings, so the eunuchs of Attics, in their oriental costume, which was the garments that he discussed, their, their female garments that they were gifted, with little images suspended on their breasts, appear to have been a familiar sight in the streets of Rome, which they traversed in procession, carrying the image of the goddess and chanting their hymns to the music of cymbals and tambourines, flutes and horns, while the people impressed by the fantastic show and moved by the wild strains, flung alms to them in abundance and buried the image at, and its bearers under showers of roses. A further step was taken by the emperor Claudius when he incorporated the Phrygian worship of the sacred tree and which it probably the orgiastic rites of Attis so orgies at the base of the tree and the also the um, castration in the established religion of Rome. The great spring festival of Cybele and Attis is best known to us in the form in which it was celebrated at Rome. But as we are informed that the Roman ceremonies were also Phrygian, we may assume that they differed hardly, if not at all, from their Asiastic original. So... Um, I know people will be like, oh, but Christmas carols, like Christmas carols are about Jesus. Um, but what about, oh, Christmas tree, oh, Christmas tree. Think about like Santa Claus. Think about all of these. I mean, there's honestly, um, sorry. Dang you headphones. <laughs> so, um, like I said, so honestly, nowadays, most of the carols are secular. They're, like, you can bring up a couple hymns, but as we'll talk about later, like, so a lot of a lot of these hymns you can still sing at a different time. <laughs> Maybe the time that God, you know, mentioned in the Bible. But anyway. He was actually born. <laughs> Anywho. Um, so I'm not really talking about Christmas hymns because, I mean, there are some Christmas hymns that are just straight up Christmas. So done. <laughs> but um, when we're talking about, um, you know, Go Come Emmanuel, like some of those, like you don't have to get rid of that. But think about all of these and they're they're programmed to just get in your head. They're catchy just to drill them in your head. And every place you go, the grocery store, you go to a church, you go to um, the movie theater, you go, blah, 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 blah. you go to the mall, you go to a satanic temple. What are they freaking playing? Christmas music. <laughs> Am I right? Oops. What did I do? Okay. So this is the festival of Osiris. This is a very interesting, but we have, so Osiris, keep in mind, is Egypt, Osiris, Egypt. But we have still to consider the Osirian festivals of the official calendar. So far as they are described by Greek writers or recorded on the monuments, the people mourned and beat their breasts as to testify their sorrow for the death of the god. And an image of a cow, which we've discussed, was carried out of the chamber in which it stood the rest of the year. The cow no doubt re represented Isis herself and symbolized the goddess searching for the dead body of Osiris. 
for this was the native Egyptian interpretation of a similar ceremony observed in Plutarch's time about the winter solstice. And well, this continues. Quick, yeah. It's very possible that the reason they specifically did this cow when they thought Moses died was it was the ritual of yes. the death of a mighty man. You're, that's a very so good point. they were going to send Moses died, so. ISIS to look for the soul of Moses in the underworld. Yes, that's a very good connection. Um, so this is continuing. Um, a great feature of the festival was the nocturnal illumination. People fastened rows of oil lamps to the outside of their houses, and the lamps burned all night long. The custom was observed throughout the whole of Egypt. This universal illumination of the houses on the night of the year suggests that the festival may have been a commemoration not merely of the dead Osiris, but of the dead in general. In other words, that it may have been a night of all souls. For it is a widespread belief that the souls of the dead revisit their homes on one night of the year and on the solemn occasion people prepare for the reception of the ghosts by laying out food for them to eat and lighting lamps to guide them on their dark road from and to the grave. Wow. <laughs> so obviously you like you a get holidays in one there. Yeah, you get Christmas lights outside you get all the Christmas lights that everybody's entranced by. Um, and this is a custom of this time. Quite a few Halloween elements. And yes, Halloween is... obviously Halloween is, is, comes to mind too, but especially Christmas with the lighting, you know, lights illuminating the house. Um, and yeah, so pretty insane. And it shows you how they can split elements into different holidays. Yes. So they can take exactly one and, element that was the lights for osiris yes and it was also for the souls of the dead to come and find but this houses. was on the winter solstice too so the custom might have been for like a very halloween-esque custom but the lights the ritual and the time was the winter solstice so that's what we'll keep reiterating is it doesn't matter the time it doesn't matter the sometimes it doesn't even matter the purpose like the halloween the all souls it's all of the rituals are the same. It does like the whole reason they put some of these rituals, like um, sometimes the pine tree ritual in the spring and sometimes, you know, the whole reason they swapped it around was to confuse people. And then people could say, oh, but, you know, the pine tree ritual was um, at the spring and we do that at the winter. Like that makes any difference when it's the exact same ritual. It doesn't matter what time it is if it's the exact same ritual. And you can go into further detail, and the occult has always done dual meanings. Yes. So they will have a meaning for the masses that mm -hmm. they use to explain away this weird behavior. Yeah. And then they'll have a secondary answer for the initiated, and those are all symbolic meanings. And if you're initiated into the meanings, then you know what they're saying and what yes. they're doing. Uh, but if you're in the masses category you're oblivious and that's just because they you, they have exerted their authority and told you what something means but only given you the bare bones yes and this is why all this information is data walled you can't buy a lot of these books for less than a couple hundred dollars yeah oh definitely i mean don't get me wrong there's a lot of accessible information that we have out here but there's a couple books that are like $200 or even thousands of dollars and they make it inaccessible to the masses for this exact reason. And scholars have known for decades. Yes, and we'll get into that. Yep. Okay, let's proceed. Um, so we'll go into Saturnalia a little bit because um, so a lot of people think that the Christmas rituals start at Saturnalia. And as we've explained, they actually go prior and they start as early as ancient Mesopotamia. So honestly, as early as the first civilization. Um, some of these common rituals, they, they sacrificed a young pig in the temple of Saturn in Rome, and we'll get into some of that. They exchanged gifts in midwinter. Slaves and could become masters for a day and wealthy. A man would be selected to be Lord of Misrule for a 30-day countdown to Saturnalia. And on the day the feast began, the Lord of Misrule was sacrificed. So he could be... He was um, essentially the king of the, and he was he was supposed to emanate um, Saturn himself, so he could do whatever he wanted. He could have whatever crazy, passionless, 
you know, drunkenness, fun he wanted. But on the last day, he was sacrificed in the temple of Saturn. And this was um, on the 25th of December. So um, so it's also called Dies Natalis Solis Invicti, which means birthday of the unconquerable sun, because it was also sun worship. Um, and we'll get into that some more. That's just a brief. So this is about the um, the Lord of Misrule. So I'll read this. This is pretty messed up. 30 days before the festival, they chose by lot from amongst themselves a young and handsome man who was clothed in royal attire to resemble Saturn. Thus arrayed and attended by a multitude of soldiers, he went about in public with the full license to indulge his passions and to taste of every pleasure however base and shameful. But if his reign was merry, it was short and ended tragically. For when the 30 days were up and the festival of Saturn had come, he cut his throat on the altar of the God whom he impersonated. In the year AD 303, the lot fell upon the Christian soldier Dacius, but he refused to play the part of the heathen God and soil his last days with debauchery. The threats and arguments of his commanding officer failed to shake his constancy and accordingly was beheaded. So what, what are you going to do? Kill me? Yeah. Oh my word. This is a Christian, like an early Christian because early Christians did not celebrate this. They did not do this. And we'll get into that. The, this was something that was that Paul preached about. So remember we looked at in the first series, we looked at, Artemis um, and Artemis worship Diana, Cybele, whatever you call her, um, in Ephesus. So Paul was talking when he was saying, don't eat this food sacrifice to idols. Don't do these sexual immoral, immoral acts. Don't do, I don't practice idolatry. This is what like was insanely prevalent in that society and in that culture. And he was constantly trying like a little child to, um, Get them to, bit by bit, let go of those things um, that were holding them hostage and holding them hostage as a people. So um, just keep that in the forefront of your mind. Like early Christians, they were taught not to partake in any of these customs. Um, something to note is Saturnalia and Yule, and we'll get into Yule, were times where the slaves and the rulers switched places and it was a time of charity. So that's important. This time and the spring equinox were the only times the wealthy seemed to ever show compassion to the needy. Wow, that seems familiar. Yeah. This culture is the same today. You look at, I mean, does who does anybody volunteer at a soup kitchen besides on Christmas or during Christmas? Does anybody donate their money besides during Christmas? Not does anybody much. give gifts to orphans besides Christmas? I mean, these are th good things that are, are commanded of us. Um, these are things in scripture that we are commanded to do, but not on days that promote this, you know, promote this, the, these rituals. So if you think about it too, Black Friday deals, and this, this is the season of commercialism, are similar to that because the poor and the middle class are inheriting these luxuries of Babylon for just the season, right? We can have our like expensive TVs for like an affordable price just for one day. Um, but the masses are still slaves and to the rulers and politicians of this world. And they control the flow of wealth. They control, you know, what poisons we eat, what we put in our bodies. Um, so they're still the rulers. Um, but for just a season, we get this taste of luxury, correct? Pretty much. Pretty much. Um, so here's some Yule rituals to, um, to compare. Um, so Yule, if you are not familiar, so Saturnalia took place in Rome and Yule took place in the Germanic tribe. So there was um, in Germany and B Bavaria and all of those regions um, and also in the Nordic places like Sweden, Norway, um, Denmark, and even in the UK. So that's kind of the region. It was ancient custom that when, sa when sacrifice was to be made, all farmers were to come to the heathen temple and bring along with them the food they needed while the feast lasted. All kinds of livestock were killed in connection with it, horses also, and all the blood from that was called hlot. 
sacrificial blood, and hlat boli, the vessel holding the blood, and hlat inar, the sacrificial twigs. And this is where you get blood pudding from. Yes. Okay, so uh, this is another thing that we need to reiterate. When they say that they sacrificed, like, these animals, they also ate them. Like, people don't connect the two. That's why it says don't eat food sacrificed to idols. It so, also says don't eat blood. Don't eat blood, so yes. this is another biblical thing where even just being there and yes. eating this stuff. Exactly. You're eating blood. It's, it's completely against the, the Bible. Yeah, so... um. This was the custom. They would kill these, slaughter these horses, but they would eat them too. They would eat the pigs that they slaughtered. So it's not, um, that's something that people think, oh, you just kill it and then that's it. No, they would also eat these animals. Those pigs that were outside the, um, where Jesus healed the demon possessed yes. man. Was that, Cap oh. I want to say Capernaum, but that's. Probably it was no, also the I Sea just, of Galilee. Yes, so, I remember. But anyway, those pigs were being raised for this. And we know that because um, it says that two thousand were drowned. Two thousand in a in a Jewish area, two thousand were drowned, which they only used like they only used pig or as they should, as they were commanded in the the Torah. That, that's a conjecture. Yes. So we can't prove that, but, but it seems very likely. But they were like, why would you need a million, why would you need 2,000 pigs if you don't eat them and you only use them for cleanup? So let's think about that. They were using these, I mean, the Rome, Romans were there too, so they were either selling it to them. Uh, but then also Peter talks about don't eat food sacrificed to idols as well, and that he he ministered to Israel. So It was a nonstop, like this is how you not a stretch. yourself is don't eat these animals. Yeah. Any of them. Um, so anyway, they were fashioned like sprinklers and with them were to be smeared all over with blood, the pedestals of the idols and also the walls of the temple within and without. And likewise, the men present were to be sprinkled with blood, but the meat of the animals was to be boiled and served as food at the banquet. Fires were to be lighted in the middle of the temple floor and kettles hung over the fires. The sacrificial beaker was to be borne around the fire and all who made the feast what, and was chieftain, was to bless the beaker as well as all the sacrificial meat. And this is from the National History Museum in Sweden. Um, the long-bearded god Odin also, he's, um, the main celebration is to Odin. He bears the name Jolnir, the Yule One. So that's where Yule comes from, or you know, um, God of healing, death, war, and wisdom of magic. And he was the God of the gallows. And we'll get into that. Um, the sacrificial rituals of the Vikings ranged from great festivals and magnets halls to offerings of weapons and jewelry and tools and lakes. Humans and animals were also hung from the trees in holy groves, according to written sources. The Vikings repeatedly used certain sacrificial sites because they believed that they was there was particularly strong contact with the gods at these locations. And we've consistently said through all of the the two other studies that um, the god, the deity, and the symbol of the deity were synonymous, and that was not a that was not a uncommon belief that the the vessel it was a vessel for the deity to inhabit so here it's saying it was particularly strong contact with the gods at these locations um in these holy groves and we also know from scripture is paul and um paul says in 10 uh first corinthians 10 20 that you, when you sacrifice to idols you're sacrificing to demons so we can infer that these are demons so also i'll interject here when I was in Ireland, oh, um, yeah. Bring this up. I had a, I just, I, I was only in Ireland for about 10 days and uh, I would meet people and it was a great time. But one of the people that I met told me before I left the area that I needed to go visit this sacred tree uh, that was a huge Catholic monument in the area. And I forget what the tree was called, um, but... Uh, he gave me directions and I went and visited it 
because I was starting to read this stuff. That was back in 2016. Um, I was starting to get into the, the sacred tree stuff and the sacred groves. So that was just this guy. I hadn't told this guy any of that. So that was just out of the blue. He said, hey, you need to go visit this site before you leave. So I visited it. And like I kid you not, as I drove up, a massive swarm of flies attacked my car. And I went, oh, hmm. this is interesting. And I'm greeted by the sight of a sign that says, warning, dangerous trees. And I went, this is weird. <laughs> and I have the picture somewhere. I may be able to find it and put it up at some point. But um, so I go and I uh, look at this sacred tree. And it is a massive ancient pine tree that all of the Catholics bring their requests to. Um, and they'll bring articles of sick people's clothing and they'll hang it on the tree. They'll bring pictures of um, Jesus and other deities, um, Christianized Tammuzes. Yeah. Uh, and I hate to say it because they're well-meaning people. Like they're they're bringing their requests to God, mm -hmm. but they've been lied to about how to do it. Yeah. So they're um, it was just, it's palpably evil area. The it it was just a oppressive sinister, sinister feeling. And, and what happened when you left? When I left, um, or was it as you were leaving? What are you referring to? Your chest pains. That was a different place primarily, but that oh. was um, that was more the obelisks. Oh yes. And Interesting. Um, areas of the Louvre, but um, it was. I'll just throw that in there because you brought it up. Here we don't notice the obelisks everywhere because the masons have blended them with our architecture beautifully. Mm -hmm. But in England. They have an obelisk on every single square of every single city. Mm -hmm. Just a straight up Egyptian obelisk. And that was when I started going, why are these all over the place? <laughs> Where are these coming Where from? Where are these coming from? Why? And I would actually like be able to feel a, like a physical like tension mm -hmm. as I got close to them. And it would call us crazy. Like weight. Yeah, and yeah. call me crazy, but as I got farther away that tension would actually decrease. Yeah. And yeah, so anyway this the spirit does follow these locations. Yeah. And as they multiply these images and these idols, it increases the like the energetic power of the spirit in mm -hmm. some way. Some way. Um, so here's some more. Um, this provides a context context in which extends its meaning from sacrifice to worship. Since the act of making a sacrifice to these recipients recipients is also understood as identical to worship. Thus, in the case of a particular grove, for example, not only does it, its role as a location for sacrificial ritual enhance its status as a holy place, but its status as a holy place also requires that sacrifice or offering be brought to it. That is said, it should be worshipped. Um, we'll kind of get into offerings for trees um, in a bit. So keep that in the forefront of your mind. Um, so here's some more. This is actually a picture. This is a um, this is a primary source. This is also from. It's a parish in Sweden. It's a carved onto a picture stone can be interpreted as blot, which is their word for sacrifice to Odin. In the middle, a person is apparently being sacrificed on an altar. So here's this the person being sacrificed. To the left, another person has a noose around their neck. And it's hanging from a tree. It's um, kind of hard to see, but there's the rope and there's the tree. Um, and then this is, yeah. So here's some evidence of that. And here's, uh, so this is to Odin. And here's a raven. And ra um, ravens are synonymous with, um, they're actually there's two um, with Odin. He, they were his helpers. Um, so here's some more. The 12th century German chronicler Adam of Bremen recalls about an a annual Yule sacrifice. The bodies are hung in a grove which stands beside the temple. So keep in mind, this is a 12th century, like, G German um, 
he, like this is a man from from this time, 12th century. And so this is a primary source. The bodies are hung in a grove which stands beside the temple. This grove is so holy for the heathens that each of the separate trees is believed to be divine because of the death and gore of the objects sacrificed. Their dogs and horses hang together with men. One of the Christians told me that he had seen 72 bodies hanging together. For the rest, the incantations which they are accustomed to seeing, there's that, oh, Christmas tree, the singing um, to the tree, you know, at this kind of sacrificial rite are manifold and disgraceful, and therefore it is better to be silent about them. So this is also where Isaiah 66 comes in. Mm -hmm. uh, you can go and read it for yourself. But in short, it specifically says in very confusing language mm -hmm. um, that when Jesus comes back, he's going to be coming after those who go into the gardens and seek after the one in the center. Yes. It, that doesn't make any sense. I have spent my entire life confused about that passage. In this context, it makes perfect, yeah. perfect sense. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil was in the center of the garden. Yeah. And all of these primary Diana trees are in the center of the garden. It's a continual cyclical. And so cycle. these sacrifices, to keep in mind that these sacrifices of humans, these human and dog and horse sacrifices, they would hang them. But this was still a fertility custom. So they were doing this to get more offspring. They were killing men to get more offspring. And that goes into our celebration of man's fall. Let's go to the tree. Let's go to the goddess or God to give us what, what you know, God told us was a consequence for our behavior. So interesting. Which ironically, God. even the demon possessed man did the opposite of that. Yes. He, he went naked to Jesus and he said, have mercy Full on of me. demons and said, have mercy on me. Yeah. Adam and Eve didn't even do that. They sewed fig leaves on themselves and ran and away hid. and went to the, yeah. the serpent. Um, so here, this is also a primary source. So this is from the National History Museum of Sweden. Um, he, Odin. So this is also um, goes into the like mythology centered around why they do um, human sacrifice on tr these trees. Um, in this context, in um, these this, this civilization, they did oak trees. Um, so it says, he, Odin, then hanged himself on y Yggdrasil, which we talked about um, in the first part. Um, so we've already said, hey, that looks a lot like the tree of knowledge. So to them, it's the tree of life, but there's a serpent at the roots of it, and it's everything else appears to be very much like the tree of knowledge. A tree with a man hanging from it? Yeah. That doesn't seem like the tree of yeah. wisdom to me. Um, so he, Odin then hang, hung, hanged himself in, in Yggdrasil, the tree of life, for nine days and nine nights in order to gain knowledge of other worlds and be able to understand the runes. During his sacrificial actions, he saw visions and received secret wisdom. Secret wisdom, the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Which is the biblical definition of witchcraft. Yes. Secret knowledge. Secret knowledge. The magical knowledge he the magical knowledge he gained made him able to cure the sick, calm storms, turn weapons against his attackers, make women fall in love. And here's the poem, uh, it's a 13th century poem, Havamal. I know that I hung on the windy windy tree um, nine whole days and nights, stabbed with a spear. Who else was stabbed with a spear? Our Messiah. Offered to Odin, myself to my own self given, high on that tree of which none have heard from what roots it rises to heaven. None refreshed me ever with food or drink. Also Messiah. I peered right down in the deep, crying aloud, I lifted the runes. Then back I fell from there. So that's, um, that's Havamal. Um, so here's, we're talking about the Yule boar, but the idea of the corn spirit as embodied in pig form is nowhere more clearly expressed than in Scandinavian custom of the Yule boar. In Sweden and Denmark at Yule, Christmas, it is custom to make a loaf in the form of a boar pig. Formerly, a real boar was sacrificed at Christmas and apparently also a man in the character of the Yule boar. 
This at least may perhaps be inferred from a Christmas custom still observed in Sweden. A man is wrapped up in a skin and carries a wisp of straw in his mouth so that the projecting straws look like the bristles of a boar. He, a knife is brought and an old woman with her face blackened pretends to sacrifice him. And that's modern Sweden. That's still observed today. That's so. what they do in public. Fun stuff. Um, so here's some more modern celebrations. Um, an instructive relic. So this is about Saturnalia. Um, so keep that. It's also about um, Osiris in Egypt too. So it's about a couple things. Um, an instructive relic of the long struggle is preserved in our festival of Christmas, which the church seems to have borrowed directly from its heathen rival. In the Julian calendar, the 25th of December was reckoned the winter solstice. Um, so people have debates on that too. They'll say, oh, but it was the 21st was the winter solstice. No, back in that time, the winter solstice was the 25th in almost every society. It was the 25th. Um, and even if it wasn't, it's the same rituals. Um, it And it was regarded as the nativity of the sun because they, the day begins to lengthen and the power of the sun to increase from the turning point of the year. The ritual of the nativity, as it appears to have been celebrated in Syria and Egypt, was remarkable. The celebrants retired into certain inner shrines from which a mid, at midnight they issued with a loud cry. The virgin has brought forth the light is waxing. The Egyptians even represented the newborn sun image by an image of an infant, which on his birthday, the winter solstice, December 25th, they brought forth and exhibited to his worshipers. No doubt the virgin who thus conceived and bore a son on the 25th of December was the great oriental goddess whom the Semites called the heavenly virgin or simply the heavenly goddess. In Semitic lands, she was known as a form of Astarte. Now Mithra was regularly identified by worshippers with the sun, the unconquerable sun, as they called him. Hence, his nativity also fell on the 25th of December. The Gospels say nothing as to the day of Christ's birth, and accordingly, the, church, the early church did not celebrate it. Um, so this is super interesting. This is in History's Vanquished Goddess Asherah. So we'll be going into this book a little bit and showing you pictures. Um, it says, on a, so this is just an interesting connection. On October 11th, 1954, Pope Pius VII officially invested Mary, the mother of Jesus of Nazareth. Oh, it's the 12th. I was thinking of the, <laughs> the 12th. Officially, that's probably like the seventh is probably like hundreds of years earlier. <laughs> anyway, um, Pope Pius the twelfth officially invested Mary, the mother of Jesus of Na as of Nazareth, as the Catholic Queen of Heaven. I will say that again: the mother of Jesus of Nazareth as the Catholic Queen of Heaven. The title we have seen from the dawn of man since ancient Mesopotamia, Asherah had that title, Anana had that title, Astarte had that title, Cybele had that title, Diana had that title. Every single goddess had that title, and they're giving it to Mary now. This is confirmed in the the Great encyclop job, <laughs> yeah the Encyclopedia of Theology, the concise. Sacramentum Mundi, which explains that although the title Queen of Heaven actually comes from mythology, it is used by the church in a mom mythological sense. So essentially the mother deity. They're trying to make Mary one of the most humble women and humble figures in the entire Bible into an abomination. <laughs> Anyway, proceeding. Um, so we're going into Christmas trees some more. Um, so I will mention that, um, so some people will argue, oh, but um, that's just a, they didn't use the evergreen. So it's not the same ritual. But the ceremony and the ritual, the whole concept was to get things that were naturally available to your civilization it wasn't about like now we have a worldwide consumerism 
like consumeristic society so we can ship trees and whatever to like random places and we can make fake crappy trees <laughs> that have all kinds of chemicals too but um anywho um but they didn't have that back then they only used what was accustomed to them so in ancient mesopotamia and babylon they used the date palm in egypt they used a sycamore they used palms as well in rome and greece they used the pine tree or the fig tree in um the scandinavian countries they typically used an oak or they would use um a pine as well or an evergreen so um that that is such a null and void argument because that was the whole concept and in that it was the same concept and we'll get into that with the red flowers so everybody says oh poinsettias aren't pagan they can't be like associated because they were like not discovered because you know mexico or whatever that's what you know that's what they say because it's native to mexico but the whole concept was to get um flowers and um greenery that was familiar to your land so in greece it was um roses and um, anemones and Rose then red flowers. yes so any red for flower any red flowers to represent specifically the blood of castrated addis that's what it represented um and then in rome we'll see it was uh, violets so let's read that um, a pine tree was cut in the woods, and we read this, but this is just so damn good. <laughs> Pardon my French. <laughs> a pine tree was cut in the woods and brought into the sanctuary of Cybele, where it was treated as a great divinity. The duty of carrying the sacred tree was entrusted to a guild of tree bearers. The trunk, think about this, was swathed like a corp with woolen bands and decked with wreaths of violet. That sounds a lot like a Christmas tree. For violets were said to have sprung from the blood of Addis as roses and anem anemones from the, blo the blood of Adonis. And the effigy of a young man, doubtless Addis himself, was tied to the middle of the stem. Be that it may, the god they personated was a deity of vegetation whose divine life manifest ma manifested itself especially in the pine tree and the violets of spring and if they died in the character of that divinity they corresponded to the mummers who are still slain in mimicry by european peasants in spring and to the priest who was slain long in grim earnest on the wooded shore of the lake of nemi these blood rituals are also where we get the colors red and green um and this is also from um, cosmic over 70 years ago scholars identified sacred trees as a symbol of the goddess asherah writing in a journal of the american oriental society article entitled the sacred tree on palestine painted pottery author harbert g may states we need not stress the point that asherah was a sacred tree meaning i mean we already know it's we don't even need to stress it it's so apparent um and that was from 2014 so it's been longer than that they could have told us. So it's been more like 80 years. Um, anyway, they, they could have told us. That'd be great information to know. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so here's the Christmas tree. Like, obviously, that looks identical. Also, the ornaments are also symbolic of the testicles of Addis or um, Adonis. So there's that too. And the they're lights, red. The they're lights, red or gold, typically. The lights go back to the day of Osiris? Yes. The gift giving? Goes back to Saturnalia, Osiris. Osiris, all of those customs. Um, and then what are you doing? You're putting the presents under the tree as an offering. That is what an offering is. And you're bowing before the tree to put your present under it. And to receive your present. And to receive your present. The, also, the tree gives you your gift. You're giving an offering to the companies who are yes. selling these goods. So yeah. think about this. When you pay money to buy your Christmas ham, Yes, somebody made turkey. that sacrifice. Somebody made a sacrifice of that pig. Yep. Specifically for Christmas. Yeah. Their, their numbers tell them how many pigs they're going to need. They raise up as many as yep. they're going to need economically. 
and they kill them specifically for Christmas. Whether they so just because you're getting it from the grocery store and not slaughtering it yourself, somebody else made that sacrifice. They, they take the blood away from, we don't have to see it anymore. Yes, it's they, palatable. They it's it a, pretty in, now. In a barn somewhere, and then they package it up. You never have to see it. It's blood. humane now. You never have to hear it squeal. Yeah. You just put it in your oven and cook it and eat it. And they've already, yep. who knows who's blessed it, what they've done. Yeah, who, who knows? That's a very good point. Um, very, very good point. Um, so this is more about the red flowers. Like I said, it doesn't matter. I think I've read both. I've, I think I've actually, um, I haven't, I'll read, read this. The parallel of these Syrian devotees confirms the view in that in similar worship of Cybele, the sacrifice of virility that took place on the day of blood at the vernal rites of the goddess, where the violet, violets supposed to spring from the red drops of her wounded lover Attis were in bloom among the pines. Indeed, the story that Addis unmanned himself under a pine tree was clearly devised to explain why her priests did the same beside the sacred violet wreath tree at his festival. So very interesting. And then this talks about Lake Nemi. And remember, we already saw this. This is a primary source. This is literally from Rome. This is a, a gesso. Um, and here is the sacred tree right next to a phallic symbol. This is the sun pillar. So it's always in every society, it's the male and the female deity um, marrying. And they, they're next to each other. And we still see these red flowers being symbolized as blood in... Um, at the, the White Tower in England. Yes, yeah, the they, Tower of Engl the Tower of London. Um, they symbolize those red flowers as blood coming out of the. You can look at pictures. It mm -hmm. looks like it's coming out of the drain. That's a good point. Flowing over the um, the wall. It was yeah. to to resemble all of the people that were killed in that castle. Yeah. They literally do that in front of you, and you see it every day. Yeah, and this is um, modern day um, the D Diana Temple at Nemi. Um, so here's, oh, you're right. Okay, so this is very interesting. So re so remember, Adam and Eve covered themselves with fig leaves. So this is just an interesting concept. This is also in Rome. And remember also, Isis, Newt, and Hathor were all seen as the lady of the Yeah, the lady of the fig. sycamore fig. Um, so he points out that the process of caprification, as it is called, that is the artificial fertilization of the cultivated fig trees by hanging strings of wild fig among the boughs. So here we get some more garland. Um, takes place in Greece and Asia Minor in June, about a month after the date of Thargelia. And he suggests that the hanging of the black and white figs around the necks of two humans, one of whom represented the men and the other the women, may have been a direct imita imitation of the process of caprification designed on the principle of imitative magic. That is important imitative magic so it doesn't matter if you believe that you're doing these rituals um in and performing magic if you're doing the ceremony it's imitative magic and that's all throughout they just want you to do it they don't care if you do it to whatever god they just want you to do it um to assist the fertilization of the fig trees and since caprification is in fact a marriage of the male fig tree to the female fig tree, the leaves of the trees may, on the same principle of imitative magic, have been stimulated by a mock or even real marriage between two human victims. This is where it gets really disgusting and sad. On this view, the practice of beating the human's victims on their genitals with the branches of wild figs and with squills was a charm intended to stimulate the generative powers of the man and woman who for the time being personated the male and female fig trees and who by their union, whether real or pretended, were believed to help the trees bear fruit. And so it's a fertility ritual. This theme continues where everything it's, you're allegedly doing for fertility is completely contrary to fertility. Yeah. Yes, like beating your genitals is supposed to help you produce more children. In what world yeah. does that make any sense? It, the same as killing your children. You're supposed to be able to be preserving your yes. children's life by killing them. Every yeah. single part of these is about stealing our life. Now remember, so just because it looks be pretty now and it looks palatable and it looks clean now, 
Um, it's still the same ritual and it's still the same spirit behind it. I can't tell you how many times I've seen like baby announcements where it was like our Christmas wish. We got a baby. I'm not kidding. Or like a pregnant woman. Like I've seen so many pregnant women take pictures by the tree. Like, oh, here's my baby and here's a tree. And if you don't know these concepts, then it looks like, oh yeah, no big deal. But when you see it with spiritual eyes, it's like, oh my word, this is everywhere. Look on your feed. You'll see this everywhere. And that in and of itself is imitative magic. You're saying, oh, this tree in the concept of a cult, you're saying that that tree is responsible for your pregnancy. The images. Yeah. In the, the eyes of the occult. Maybe not in the eyes of you, but that's the occult. That's the demons. That's um, the and accuser. that's why we're being told to separate from Yeah. Them, so that we're not... God knows that's not our heart. Yes, absolutely. That's why he's saying, look, I know this is for your benefit, so that when I judge, I can judge these spirits yeah. without you standing next to them, standing yes. near them. That's why he told Lot to leave Sodom and Gomorrah. Mm -hmm. It's that, hey, look, this is about to burn. Move out of the way. Yeah. So um, when you read, um, when you read the scripture with this lens in mind and with your eyes opened to Asherah and what Asherah symbolized in their rituals, um, the whole Bible comes to life. And so I'll read a couple things um, that will really jump out to you now. The sin of Judah is written with a pen of iron and with the point of a diamond. It is graven upon the tablet of the heart and upon the horns of your altars. Like the symbols of their sons are their altars and their asherim are by the leafy trees upon the high hills. Hmm. Um, for the customs of the people are in vain. And we've already read that. I won't read that again. And then look at them putting the branch to their nose. And in some translations it says, Look at them putting the branch to my nose. And that uh, specifies, we didn't get the information in this because we're trying to parse it down. But um, in short, the people that didn't have enough money to buy a tree or have yeah. a, a sacred tree or an idol of Asherah, they would actually um, take sprigs of that sacred tree that was like the village's large like mm -hmm. primary idol. And they would take them into their house and ask the hope that that branch would take the spirit of the fertility goddess into their home yes. and help them to have And they, that's where you get wreaths, garland, you name it. Um, that's where you get that is the people who couldn't afford to bring a tree in their home or didn't have the space for it or whatever. They would buy or find these sprigs and wind them together and weave them together into a greenery and this this mindset is as recent as like early 1800s england yes that that's very modern that's yes. not a new concept at all that's a good point um so this is very interesting so we'll look at um some the historical count and then we'll also look at um scripture what scripture tells us about this the heathen of Haran offered to the sun, moon, and planets human victims who were chosen on the ground of their supposed resemblance to the heavenly bodies to which they were sacrificed. For example, the priests clothed in red and smeared with blood offered a red-haired, red-cheeked red red man to the red planet Mars in a temple which was painted with red and draped with red hangings. And then in Second Kings the 23, horsemen. yep, Second Kings 23, this is Josiah um, cleaning out the temple. And he brought out the grove from the house of the Lord without Jerusalem unto the brook of Kidron and burned it and the brook of, at the brook of Kidron and stamped it small to powder and cast the powder, therefore, upon the graves of the children of the people. The graves upon the children of the people. Why the children? This is the same type of event that you see with Moses where he ground up the golden calf. Yes. Smashed it to powder, threw it in the water, and made the people drink it. And why the children of the people? The graves of the children of the people. Because they were killing them in this this ritual. And he broke he break down the houses of the Sodomites, their male cult prostitutes, and we'll get into that. That were by the house of the Lord where the women wove hangings for the grove. So that's where you get garlands. That's where you get stockings. Like hangings for the grove. Interesting. 
Um, so I'm going to go to this. This book is just incredible. This is History's Vanquished Goddess. It's not super expensive either. It's I think it's like 20 bucks on Amazon. Um, anywho, this is so, and it's got amazing pictures. So if you're very visual, this is a great, great book. It's got all kinds of primary sources. Um, it's great. So of course, so this is in the context of the cult prostitutes. According to the biblical text, Second Kings 23, 7, King Josiah's reform included the removal of the sacred male prostitutes from Jerusalem temple. The Hebrew goddess states the function of the sacred male prostitutes was related to the fertility cult centering in the figure of the mother goddess Asherah. Possibly their services were made use, made use of by childless women who visited the sanctuary in order to become pregnant. Such pilgrimages to the holy places for the purpose of removing the curse of barrenness have remained an important feature of popular religion down to present day among Muslims, Jews, and Christians alike in all parts of the Middle East. The original Hebrew word used kedashim is exclusively masculine, prohibiting female inclusion. To include female prostitutes, it would have been necessary to use both masculine and feminine. So very interesting. So they literally went to the temple of God to perform like orgies so that they could get pregnant for and be blessed by the Asherah. That was specifically why they did it. And that's why the cult prostitutes were there next to Asherah. And then it coincided. It was because it was a fertility ritual. So um, here's mistletoe. This is very interesting. So the plant is a fertility symbol in the soul of the oak tree um, to the Druids. Belief was that the mistletoe could come to the oak tree during a lightning flash. Mistletoe was gathered at midsummer and winter solstices. The plant, when it grew on the venerated oak tree, was especially sacred to the Celts. On the sixth night of the full moon after Yule, white-robed Druid priests gathered oak mistletoe by cutting the plant with golden sickles. Two white bulls were sacrificed with prayers that the recipients of the mistletoe would prosper. So that's a really interesting picture of a priestly duty. Um, everyone stood in awe as the mistletoe pierced Balder, bringing him down in his death. The gods wept bitterly, no more, no one more than Frigg. In one ending of this myth, Frigg is so destroyed with the pain at the loss of Balder that she is overcome with tears. So Frigg is um, a goddess um, in uh, Nordic uh, mythology. And um, then it also says her outpouring of tears are reflected in the milky white berries of the mistletoe. Frigg convinces every being to weep for Balder so that he may be restored to life. And then he's brought back to life from Frigg, the woman, the woman goddess. And then also by everybody weeping for Balder. That sounds very familiar, don't you think? Um... Then mistletoe was worshipped by the Druids, as we learn from the passage of Pliny. The Druids esteem nothing more than the mistletoe and the tree on which it grows, provided only that the tree is an oak. But apart from this, they chose they choose oak woods for their sacred groves and perform no sacred rites without oak leaves, so that the very name of Druids may be regarded as a Greek appellation derived from the worship of the oak. So it's all about obviously worshiping, bringing worship to the oak. For they believe that whatever grows on these trees is sent from heaven and is a sign that the tree has been chosen by God himself. Man. <laughs> that. It's a sign, sent from heaven. And then we already read this part. Um, but this is very interesting. I didn't, um, this is straight from this, this, the, the, book they believe that a, a potion prepared from mistletoe will make barren animal bring forth same for same thing we've seen right that the deity is the god and the god is the deity and that they use this for fertility and they use this to sacrifice humans and their children once you boil it down to the basics yep it's so simple yes 
So fruitcake. Most people hate fruitcake, but we'll still talk about it. <laughs> what is the red and green? Yes. Well, I mean, most Christmas foods are really straight up just food sacrificed to idols. They're specifically made specifically for the tradition of the ritual of Christmas. So, um, but since we left um, off making offerings to the queen of heaven and pouring out drink offerings to her, we have lacked everything and have been consumed by the sword and by famine. This is Jeremiah 44, by the way. And the women said, we, when we made offerings to the queen of, queen of heaven and poured out drink offerings for her, was it without our husband's approval that we made cakes for her bearing her image and poured out offerings, drink offerings to her? So that's just an interesting connection. Um, and then the women gather wood, the fathers kindle fire, and the women need dough to make cakes for the queen of heaven. And they pour out drink offerings to other gods to provoke me to anger. The Lord said to me, go show your love to your wife again, this is Hosea, um, though she is loved by another man and is an adulteress. Love her as the Lord loves the Israelites, though they turn to other gods and they love the sacred raisin cakes. And then um, this is very interesting. This is also from the history's vanquished goddess Asherah. They have, they found, um, this is 1800 BC. I couldn't find it online. So I'm going to try to show you. They actually found a mold um, for these cakes. So that's just really like shows you the Bible is historically factual. Um, discovered at Mari, this ancient cake bread mold reveals that cakes or breads were baked for the queen of heaven over 12,000, or it's not 12,000, 1200 years before the biblical baking for the goddess condemnation by the prophet in Jeremiah 7. Interesting. The Bible comes alive. Um, so this is very this is very interesting. So this book, I recommend everybody buy this book because it is not only is it an interesting read, it's got great pictures and stuff. Obviously, it's like creepy pictures, but but this guy, he does a great job telling history, but also in a somewhat humorous sense. And you'll you'll see what I mean. Um, but he talks about so he, his whole study is about Krampus and the history of Krampus and and Santa um, so this is creepy. In the dark of their marble crypt in the Basilica di Nicoli, Nicola, um, that's um, St. Nicholas's um, chapel in uh, Italy, the bones of the long dead saint lie weeping. Where have we heard that? Lie weeping. For centuries now, they have been observed to exude a small but precious quantity of mysterious, alleged sweet-smelling liquid Variously referred to as oil, myrrh, or manna. Oh, that's blasphemous. I know. Manna. They call it manna. Oh, when Yeshua is our, our manna from heaven. So that is very blasphemous. Despite claims by skeptics that the phenomenon must have something to do with condensation, an aura of the supernatural attaches itself to the substance and is treasured by the faithful as a source of miraculous healing. So people would come to this place where the bones are and seek healing from these bones. First noted in 343, shortly after Nicholas's death, the magical power of these magical power Physician, heal yourself. of these weeping bones was a factor driving the spread of the St. Nicholas cult to the rest of Europe. So this spread, oh, I need to go here and be healed by these bones. The Byzantine princess Theophanu, who also built Germany's first church dedicated to Nicholas in Brawweiler near Cologne that same year. Here, a tooth of the saint was enshrined. They enshrined a tomb, or not a tomb, a tooth. Oh, my word. That is so blasphemous and idolatrous. Um, so Odin and Santa, there's a lot. So everybody talks about Saint. Oh, it's Saint Nick. It's uh, Saint Nicholas. Um, yes, Saint Nicholas was one of the, um, and I'll move my face so you can see this picture up here. Here we go. Um, but St. Nicholas, yes, St. Nicholas was definitely one of the the, the um, inspirations behind the character Santa Claus. 
but it wasn't the only one. And one of the huge ones, especially where we get all our mythology, is from Odin, the Norse god. Um, so Christians of the Roman Empire and Middle Ages incorporated many ri pagan rituals from both Saturnalian Yule, King of Christmas, and Lord of Christmas. That's Those were his titles in 16th century Britain. King of Christmas and Lord of Christmas. King of Christmas and Lord of Christmas. Santa has many different origins, one famous being the Saint Nicholas, a Greek bishop of the Roman Empire during the 3rd century. He was known for his charitable work with children and orphans. Santa also derives from the Norse mytho mythological deity Odin. And here's Odin down below. Um, this is a primary source. The other two are not. Oh, yeah. Okay. This one's a primary source. This is him on his eight-legged horse, which we'll get into. Um, his magical eight-legged flying horse. Anyway. Um, so here's some similarities. The 12th day of Yule Festival, it started this 21st and ended the 1st of January, was called Odin's Wild Hunt. Odin would fly through the sky at night with a magical eight-legged horse, Slipner. Santa has eight reindeer. And he flies in the sky. <laughs> Sounds like St. Nicholas. Odin was known for making many forms and had many names. Oops, sorry. You're going to do this. Yeah. You're the you're the, the tech person. So um, many forms and many names. We've heard that before. Myriad name, the woman of many names. But one of his favorite forms was that of an old white bearded traveler clad in a cloak and broad brimmed hat or hood. Odin, and that sounds obviously like Santa. Odin would use this attire as disguise when he was traveling through the nine realms. He traveled in the sky during the nights of Yule, rewarding good and punishing evildoers. Santa was originally depicted as a tall, slender um, man with a fur-trimmed cloak, broad-brimmed hat, or hat and a white horse. So he had a, and this is the picture of that. If you look, he has a white horse right here. Um, this was his original, like, appearance. Um, the dwarves and elves of Norse mythology were known to be creators of marvelous things, such as Odin's magical spear, Frey's magical ship, and Thor's magical hammer and other known gifts. Along with Freya, Odin also was the seeing judge that would decide who would enter Valhalla. He sent out two ravens, Hugin and Munin, every morning to collect news from the nine worlds and every night they would report back to who was good and who was bad. So he's all knowing and all seeing. One of Odin's most popular titles was all father. He is called Joel Fior, Joel father. Um, so these are, so this is an image of, this is what Odin they thought would look like. And this is an image of Santa. Um, and this is, this is, I don't know if this is accurate at all. Um, but it's just a very interesting image. It's very like, um, there's a lot of similarities there. I don't know if there's anything to it, but Before we move very on, interesting. The white horse is a good uh, place to mention the occultic white magic and black magic yes. uh, game. Because we're about to go into yep. the black magic side of this. So the white magic is the palatable, pretty, yeah. um, pleasant looking smelling part of the spell the white magic is the the pretty part of the spell yeah the part of the spell that they get in the the, the uh, normal yep. common people involved in and the black magic is the darker side of it that they keep secret it's the the part of the spell mm -hmm. where they're actually spilling blood where yes. they're actually committing sacrifices and the next video we're going to get into the dark magic so just because you're not participating in the dark magic somebody else is and they want you to carry out the lighter more appealing magic and that's actually what gives them more power you're essentially putting your stamp of approval yes. on what they are doing in secret. I mean, a good example of this is um, Christmas wasn't um, celebrated in America until like the er, mid 1800s, maybe even later uh, it than was that. Two hundred years in. Because before. I know Victoria, um, she kind of made the Queen Victoria popular popularized the Christmas tree and Christmas in general. 
Um, but, um, she, so anyway, America, we didn't really participate in Christmas and look at the fruit over like 150 years. And now we're starting to get into I, the gender confusion and let's castrate ourselves and let's become androgynous and genderless. Our government that is no the fruit of these rituals. These... Whether you believe it or not, that is the fruit of these rituals. Is not knowing our heritage, first off, who we are, um, who we, how we were created by God. Um, and then it all stems from Adam and Eve because the enemy de hates despises that Adam and Eve are different and unique. He wants to merge them. Anyway, proceeding. Um, so this is a very interesting spiritual connection. One day this like dawned on me when somebody was asking, I don't know if I should bring this up to my children. Like, I don't know if Santa is a good thing to teach my children. And this verse popped up to me. I was like, this is the, this is the simplicity of a child. Let's think about that. This is how they will see that. You'll see the scripture and they'll be like, but Santa... Santa goes through the chimney. So um, this is you sh this is Jesus. Um, in John 10, it says, Truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs in another way, that man is a thief and a robber. And you can use that spiritual lens as he climbs into secretly at night into people's homes. Um, it's, I mean, would you let a stranger do, do that in real life? <laughs> I am the door. This is Jesus. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and find, go in and out and find pasture. The thief does not come to steal, to come except to steal and to kill and destroy. I have come that they might have life and life abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep, but a hireling, he who is not the shepherd, which has been our, um, leaders and our shepherds, our spiritual leaders are the hireling. One who does not own the sheep sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf catches the sheep and scatters them. The hireling flees because he's a hireling and does not care about the sheep. I am the good shepherd and I know my sheep and I uh, and am known by my own. As the father knows me, even so I know the father and I lay down my life for the sheep and other sheep I have which are not of this fold, them also I must bring and they will hear my voice and there will be one flock and one shepherd. So it's important to note here, the story about Solomon and the two mothers is the parallel to this. It's yeah. the, the secret message is um, Jesus, Yeshua has told us and shown us. He came and he laid his life down for our sins mm -hmm. and on the inverse this other person spirit who's saying he wants us to be blessed and happy yeah. and cared for is expecting us to kill ourselves and do all of these rituals that kill everything around us mm -hmm. and solomon knew that if he said to kill the child yeah the real mother was going to show herself because she had empathy and pity for the child and we're in that phase where Jesus is saying, I have empathy for you. I have pity for you. I don't want you to die. Yeah. And you look at the spirit that is pushing death and you know, that's not your father. That's not your mother. Um, I have a, a, a thought that just popped in my head um, for parents. So let's say your child, some adult told your child things that are so above their train of thought like um, things that their innocence does not comprehend, like um, something, I don't know. Um, I mean, especially like, let's go into the um, fertility rituals. They're very sexual and they're very sexually inappropriate. And what if somebody came to your child that's innocent and doesn't know any of this stuff and came to your child and told them explicit things that they didn't understand and then they came to you and asked you, hey, what does this mean? Like, he, he told me to do this or whatever. Um, what does that mean? That is how God feels. Yeah, that's really He has that. told, the enemy has told us how to worship God in this innocent way. And it is not innocent. 
and we go to the father and he's like who taught you this it's the same thing as the garden of eden who told you you were naked you were were, i'm gonna cry who told you (laughs) i'm emotional sorry who told you you were naked that's how the father feels like i'm we're not trying to make you feel like you are guilty and condemned we're broken we're heartbroken that our people have been led astray by evil men and evil demons and so it's the same concept who told you you were naked you were perfect so anyway yeah that was really good oh Thank you, Holy Spirit. <laughs> that just came. Um, so um, this is just an interesting picture right here. Of here's Santa's milk and cookies under the tree. And then this just like looks identical to me. That might just be me. I might be making a stretch, but that looks identical. It'd be a stretch if that was the only connection yeah, you had. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so here's Krampus. So Krampus is also like they are one in the same. So this is the black magic. And this the is white the black magic. magic, black magic, and the white magic. So the white magic is the happy, appealing Santa, and the black magic is, um, the Krampus and the the demon. Gifts on one side, abuse on the other. Yes, the Krampus is a character from European Alpine folklore, common in Austria and Switzerland. The creature stands on two hooves and has horns growing out of its skull. An extremely long tongue hangs out of its mouth, and it carries a basket to haul away naughty children. For hundreds of years, the Krampus and St. Nicholas have worked a kind of good cop, bad cop routine. St. Nick rewards the good children. Krampus terrorizes the bad, and it's brutal the way he terrorizes them, and we'll go into that. So these pictures are very... This this little boy is bowing and praying to this Krampus. I just never saw that and then this this child and we'll get into this too the culture of santa this child isn't even looking at the uh saint nicholas she's just like enamored with the toys so that's an interesting thing so here is this is they would literally drag these children off so krampus would drag the children off and they would be just forgotten they'd never be found it's very evil so and then they would chain them up So here they are all chained up together. And this is honestly the spiritual truth of where we are as the body of Christ, the body of Messiah, as as Israel, the kingdom of God. We are children that have been led astray. Okay. This is very comical, actually. (laughs) The figure of Nicholas, St. Nicholas, might be added as something of a decorative afterthought to an already robust peasant tradition is a point stressed by Viennese Krampus researcher Otto Koenig. So he was like a side, he wasn't important. It was about Krampus. Koenig questions the real significance of the character as one assigned at once the most senior role and yet playing no central function. He describes Nicholas's position within the Krampus customs as rather tenuous observing only when he makes his entrance during a house visit with recited dog roll admonitions and gifts is he able to briefly dominate the children. Only then when he's giving the gifts is he actually capturing the kids attention. If left alone to the boys to coordinate the parades, there is never Nicholas, he writes, never. They're, they're loser. just loser. He is only really important where the parish priest is put in charge. <laughs> there you go. Koenig also observed that it could be, it could also be difficult for the troop to even find a willing member to play St. Nicholas. That sometimes it would even fall as last resort to a female because they couldn't find somebody. So that's quite interesting. So here, the enemy is bribing us. Like, please do this. Pay attention to please me. Please pay attention to me. Even. Yeah. Have you ever thought of, so when I brought this up, um, leaving milk and cookies for Santa might be an offering because in a lot of the times it's beside a tree or under a tree. Just like the Egyptians did. They yes, put the food exactly. in by the idol. Yep. And then that was an Egyptian the picture. Day, after they believed that the idol had enough time to absorb the essence, yep. they would take it away and eat it. Yes. Um, so this is about the birth of Jesus changed to the Dece- December 25th. What considerations led the ecclesiastical authorities to institute the festival of Christmas? The motives for the innovation are st- 
stated with great frankness by a Syrian writer, himself a Christian. So this is a primary source that he's quoting. The reason he tells us why the fathers transferred the celebration of the 6th of January to the 25th of December was this. It was a custom of the heathen to celebrate on the same 25th of December, the birthday of the sun, at which they kindle lights and token of festivity. And these solemnity, solemnities and festivities, the Christian also took part. Accordingly, when the doctors of the church perceived that the Christians had a leaning to this festival, they took counsel and resolved that the true nativity should be solemnized on that day and the festival of the Epiphany on the 6th of January. Accordingly, along with this custom, the practice has prevailed of kindling fires till the 6th. The heathen origin of Christmas is plainly hinted at, if not tactically admitted, by Augustine when he exhorts, his Christian brethren, not to celebrate that solemn day like the heathen on account of the sun, but on account of him who made the sun. Yeah. Digest that. Digest that. And this will we'll go to you because this is very interesting. Do you want the headphones? Yeah, I'm fine. Okay. So this is where we start to actually siphon this down, not just by traditions, but by location. Yes. Um, because this moment, when I found this piece, just both horrified me and uh, made it click into place in a way that I never even thought possible. The primary center of this worship in Rome was on Vatican Hill, where the Basilica of St. Of Peter now stands. They literally, the most holy place for Catholics and Christians for millennia was this point of Phrygian worship where they would set up these idols of jealousy and carry out these barbaric rituals. From the Vatican as the center of this bar barbarous system of superstition seems to have spread to other parts of the Roman Empire. Inscriptions found in Gaul and Germany prove the provincial sanctuaries modeled their ritual on that of the Vatican. And you see in a second, we're going to go to the speech of Pope John Paul II. And one of my favorite sayings is, the devil can't help but tell the truth. Mm -hmm. He will find a way to brag in subtle ways, even if he's trying to be secretive and coy. Mm -hmm. When you know his language, it all just falls out there on the floor. Mm -hmm. So Pope John Paul II says, The Feast of Christmas, perhaps the most cherished by popular tradition, is full of symbols connected with the different cultures. Now, if the nativity of the Messiah, the God of Israel, is loved by the rest of the world, we have problems. Because Jesus even told us, mm -hmm. the world hated me. If yes. it loves you, you're of the world. Yes. So the very fact that he's going, oh yeah, this is about all of the all of the cultures, mm -hmm. including Satan, say, Satanists and witches, yeah. <laughs> who complain the Christians stole their holiday. Yeah. The Pope is saying, yeah, all the cultures, every nation loves this holiday. Red flag. Together with the nat nativity scene, as is true here in St. Peter's Square, we find the traditional Christmas tree, a very ancient custom. This verse is one of the first moments when it all kind of started snapping into shape and I started digging into the trees of life. Because at first I was digging into Yggdrasil and trying to figure out the connection. But when he went, this is the tree of life, that was what brought me back to Inanna, Mesopotamia, uh, Assyria, because all of them had their tree of life. And then it's just a matter of looking up the pictures and the, the culture um, the cultural elements of that tree of life and it just sort of expands on itself. Mm -hmm. So he tells on himself here it's a very ancient custom which exalts the value of life, I beg to differ, as in winter the evergreen becomes a sign of undying life. Just like when Adam died, he didn't physically die right away. He stayed green for a while, just like this evergreen. In general, the tree is decorated and Christmas gifts are placed under it. 
The symbol is also eloquent from a typically Christian point of view. It reminds us of the tree of life, a representation of Christ, God's supreme gift to humanity. So throughout ancient pagan iconography, whenever a symbol, we've already re referred to this, um, that symbol shown, shows ownership. That's just a repeat. So um, now that we've been reminded of that concept, however, these pictures start to become appalling. This is in St. Peter's Square at the center where this Phrygian worship originated from in Rome. And you've got the giant pine tree with the star of Ishtar on top of it. You've got the T of Tammuz. You have another star or a sun. The obelisk, which was the phallic symbol of Ra. You've got another star of Ishtar over the nativity, which shows possession of this baby. It shows ownership of this baby. If this was Jesus, he should be way up here. He should be at the top. You can't even see this baby. Um, there is... Um, let's see. Here's another angle of it. And this is yearly. They do this every single year to this day. They've never stopped. Christianity, the disciples' Christianity, did not win. They were killed along with our Messiah. And it's only now that we have the chance to come back to life and be resurrected. These symbols took over the world, and this was what the disciples were fighting against. You, We just kind of have a uh, slideshow here of some, uh, some more of the similarities, these ancient icons and the modern variants and how dreadfully similar they are. I mean, the red wool bands... The red wool bands, we've referred to that. That was the burial wrapping of, of Tammuz. The the red balls, the testicles, the, um, the blood, the symbols of death. It's just rife with it. You've got the, um, the circle of worshipers around this sacred tree here. Um, and modern iconography, you've got this in um, all of your Christmas movies. Um, the circling the Christmas tree and dancing around it and singing songs to it. We don't think of it as worship because the spirits have um, lied to us about worship, about what worship means. Worship means to obey, to bow down, to prostrate. Um, if you're carrying out these customs on its behalf, it told us, this is what I want you to do. And if we obey that, we're worshiping it, whether we like it or not. Notice all of the, like, now you'll never be able to look at a tree and not notice these red flowers and these red bands and the pine cones and the golden balls. That's a representation of the, the fruit that they ate that allegedly gave them wisdom. And perfect timing. This next part is all Anna. So I will let you take it away from here. Why, thank you. Um, so I noticed um, when I would look up, I don't know, like Christmas tree or Christmas spirit, Christmas magic, whatever, um, Christmas, just even just looking up hashtag Christmas um, on like social media, like Facebook and Instagram, I just started noticing such spiritual spiritually relevant things in the comments and in the captions and in the pictures that just show not only is it not about Jesus, but also that the spirit behind um, this worship has given people uniform thought on what to say. And sometimes they're straight up doing these rituals and they don't even realize it. It's, quite um it's quite insane so um i'm just gonna go through some of these so <laughs> the little yahoos in the back um i'm gonna go through some of these 
So this one is just interesting. It's always about it's always about commercialism. It's always about things and materialism. There's just something about the mall during the holidays. Just something about it. Um, this one's creepy. It's just, is it just me or does a tree without a single ornament feel oddly satisfying? Like I appreciate the bells and whistles. We all do, I know, and absolutely I'll make room for such. Oh, and we can't imagine not decorating a tree, right? But there's just something so beautiful about the lights twinkling and dancing on stealing the show that captures the essence of the season for me. It's simple, classic, it's King of Christmas. And King of Christmas is a title from Odin and from St. Nicholas. So it's true, but especially Odin. Odin was called King of Yule and Father of Yule. So that is just insane that they would say King of Christmas. And they don't even know the spiritual implication of what that means um, and the historical implication. So this one down here is so creepy. Christmas magic is silent. Christmas magic is silent. It's hidden. It's secretive. It's it's um, not out in the open. It's not obvious. You don't hear it. You feel it. You feel the Christmas magic. You know it. You believe it. So... Like we've said, imitative magic, and they, they don't even hide it. They call it Christmas magic. And they say it's silent even because it's the white magic. Oh, yes. Okay. Um, tree day. Morning. We are getting our Christmas tree from the farm today. I'm so excited. Have you gotten yours up yet? I mean, I don't know how many people I, I scroll through and they're like, have you gotten your tree up? Have you gotten your tree up? Have you gotten your tree up? It's like this anticipation, like everybody has to do it. And that's part of the worship. Everyone has to do it. And I can't tell you how many people are outright angered that we don't have just even just the tree. We don't have a tree in our home. Um, people get straight up emotional and anger. Like they provoked to madness um, and anger when we say, no, we don't, we don't have a tree in our home. We don't do that. Um, even if we don't even tell them what it is, some people get mad about that. And that just, what does that show you about the spiritual significance of that? Um, this one down here, it's not often I pop, pop photos of family on the grid, but I love this one and wanted the memory on here. Choosing the Christmas tree. It's this special significant thing, choosing the right one. One of my favorite days of the year. And for the first time in 15 years, there were no arguments and they didn't choose one way, one way too big. So I know every family argues, but there is something about the holidays. I have seen it myself. Every time my family would put up decorations when I was growing up, there was always, always, always a fight. There's something about the spirit that provokes not only anger, but <clears throat> not peace. Just the opposite of peace, unrest, especially in the home. So when you're like bringing these idols into your home and then you're you're wondering, why am I fighting so much with my husband? Why am I fighting so much with my children? Why are my children being crazy? Why are they having nightmares? You have to wonder, um, this sounds crazy, but then when you see the historical context and the spiritual context and the biblical context of it, is it crazy though to say, oh, well, why is my, I have my, my tree up and then all of a sudden my kids started getting nightmares every night. Like, think about this. Think, the, people need to start seeing, believers need to start seeing with spiritual eyes. This isn't just some fantasy. It's in scripture. It clearly tells us this is real. Spiritual warfare is real. Um, demons and the idols that they resemble are real. And yet we just ignore that and we think, oh, yeah, that's... Th that's not true. That can't happen. And it's so inaccurate. And it happens way more than people think because they're bringing all these unclean images into their home. Um, so here's some creepy one. The Santa one. Believe in love. Believe in magic. Hell, believe in Santa Claus. Believe in others. Believe in yourself. Believe in your dreams. If you don't, who will? Oh, I believe in Santa Claus. And that's the enemy. The enemy always says, oh, if you don't celebrate this, who will? Who will celebrate it? Everybody we all else. have to celebrate it. If you don't believe in magic, if you don't believe in Santa Claus, if you don't believe in love, love has nothing to do with Christmas. It, it was about castrating men and killing children on the altar of Asherah. It has nothing to do with love. It's never had anything to do with love. 
It has to do with reversing the curse that God gave Adam and Eve. Instead out of, of fear. Out of fear. Instead of going to Messiah and cleansing us and healing us and giving us the commandments that freed us from this in the first place. Um, a good thing done between installation. This is just so creepy. Branch by branch. Lighting and decorating. It will have taken no less than five days. Dedicating five days to making sure that tree is absolutely perfect. Where is Jesus? Where is Jesus in any of these traditions? Where is it? I don't see one thing about Jesus. This one is so creepy. Christmas has arrived in our home, third Christmas here, and I fall more in love with this tree every year. Falling in love with the tree, giving homage to it, giving worship and adoration to the tree. So a little note, the word Asherah comes from the Hebrew root Asher, which is bliss or happiness. Mm Mm-hmm. And this is what we're, I mean, every time you hear someone talk about it, they say, oh, Christmas I just love cheer, the Christmas spirit. Christmas I love the joy. Christmas cheer. Yeah. Joy to the world. It's always been this this way. It's this, yeah. like, blast of false dopamine. Yes. Where you're really excited for a little bit, and then it's over, and the dopamine's gone, and yep. you're depressed. And I'm going to ask you if you've ever felt this way. So at, right after Christmas is done... And everybody's open presents and there's just a mess everywhere and everybody's so happy with their toys. And then a couple hours pass. Are you satisfied? I'm going to ask you that. Are you satisfied? Do you feel complete? Do you feel the fullness of Messiah? Or is it this withering away joy? Because it's over. Because true joy is everlasting and it it and our messiah even though we go through struggles he will constantly fill us with gratitude and love and peace abund over and abundantly and so if you're having these feelings right after right after christmas just like i don't know right after a drug right after you're done with the high and you feel unsatisfied with your life and you feel unsatisfied with things and and you want more you want more. Um, if this is you, then think about the spiritual context of that and what that implies. And also, again, this goes back to your like childhood. Where yes. You've been trained from birth. Just like they train an animal, they yeah. train you with this sugar and these treats. And they tell your family that if they don't train the kids and they're just not good parents and they don't love their kids and mm-hmm. it's not authentic – and it's just this continuing, I mean, there's pageants in school. From yeah. The time you're... you're constantly being rewarded as a child for um, celebrating this. So I, I understand if you're emotional about this situation because this was your whole childhood. This was, but I will ask another thing. So I've seen so many, this is in so many instances accurate. I know so many people that had just brutal, terrible, terrible childhoods. Just af- absolutely unstable home life. Um, brutal things happen to them as a child. And the only good memories they tend to have are of Christmas. So that is emotional to hold all of that. But then right after the abuse or right after Christmas is over, the family goes to abuse again. The household becomes abusive again. It's just for that one moment that there's happiness and joy temporary happiness and joy and then it's stripped to abuse and neglect and whatever and so i'm going to ask you again if that was if that's you think about um in all of the historical context we've shown you look at saturnalia and yule they both had the slaves became the rulers for that season but then after Christmas was over, after the celebrations were over, they were back to square one and they were back to the abuse. So if the only good memories you have are of Christmas, then there was not good fruit in your home. And that doesn't make Christmas bear good fruit. Because if it truly bore good fruit, then there would be rep- a cycles and a continuous cycles of repentance in your household. And there'd be forgiveness and there'd be apologies and there'd be accountability. But... In a lot of cultures and a lot of 
homes. That is not the case. The only time the family gets together, the only time they don't fight is Christmas. Um, here's a, a little bit Christmas tree obsessed. Can you see our real tree that we picked up today creeping in the picture on the left, which that's super creepy if you know the context that idols are demons creeping on the left, decorating tomorrow, and then I promise no more treats. I promise. I can't. I can't help it. I'm addicted to trees. One Where's... more interjection. Uh, it's also important to note that nature hates a vacuum. Yes. And so we're not even suggesting just rip all this stuff out and stop doing it. Yeah. We're just saying be aware of it. Yeah. Be and, spiritually and start aware. start looking at it and start learning to hate it. Yes. Because uh, it's just like when you're changing your diet up. If you try to get rid of all of the things that are bad all at once, you you're go back. You're going to crave them. You're going to want them. And you're exactly them, right. And you're going to end up going back to it. So the, the point is to all of the nutritionists say start removing yes. one bad thing at a time. Make that a habit. Yeah. And replace it. As you take it out, replace it with something healthy. Yeah. Maybe a good priority. I think the a really good priority is, okay, where to start? If you're thinking, oh my gosh, I, this, I have to end this, but I don't know how and where to start because you've been doing this your whole life. A good way to start is just no tree. Just start with no tree. No, I, I can't stand when people just say, oh, I'll just call it a Jesse tree. It's just like say, saying, oh, I'll stamp Jesus on the nativity. And it's, that's about Jesus. When the Osiris story is the same, the Addis story, the Adana story, the Tamu story is all the same. Well, just slapping God, the name God on. God even said, when you go into the nations, don't carve my yes. name on their altars. You a Jesse tree is the same burning. thing as a Christmas tree. Just because you name it something else, it is the same exact thing. And do not put verses of our Holy Father and his name on your tree. I keep seeing ornaments of the name of the Messiah and his beautiful names. King of Kings, Lion and the Lamb, Alpha and Omega on trees. Please don't do it. I beg of you. And this is a good segue <laughs> to the stones of the altar. Yes. Uh, the stones that um, King, um, crap, I'm... in the, the book of the Maccabees. Oh, uh, Antiochus. Antiochus, thank you. Um, the stones of the altar that King Antiochus had them sacrificing pigs on. Mm -hmm. It had previously been the altar of God in yes, the temple. and it was clean. And so when the Maccabees came through and they cleansed the temple, they didn't know what to do with those stones because they had previously been holy and then they were defiled. And it mm -hmm. says that they set them at a in a court in the temple until a prophet could come and tell them what to do with those. Yes. And then later on, that's the passage in John. Um, so yeah, that's in Maccabees 1. Uh, the book of Maccabees, first book of Maccabees. And then that's in John 10 when Yeshua is in the temple at the Feast of Dedication, which is Hanukkah, which is the celebration of um, rededicating the temple of the Lord. He um, angers the Pharisees so much that it says that they take their, in the temple of the, the Solomon's porch, they're literally there where the where they said that the Maccabees put these stones and said, okay, we'll wait for a prophet to tell us what to do with these stones. And the Pharisees, what did they do? They got so angered by what Yeshua was telling them about how they, how they do things and how they honor their commandments over God, that they took those stones that were in this area and try, uh, tried to stone Jesus. So they literally set those stones aside to wait for a prophet. And when the prophet does come, they, they try, try to, to stone, stone him with, with the same altar. Yeah. So, I mean, you can, that's a, that's a connection you can make. Now it doesn't clearly say, but you could infer that if that is the case, it's a really strong way. Cause it's the same time period, um, yeah, the same sure. celebration. And it also shows that Yeshua celebrated Hanukkah. So we can do a segue into yeah. that and how we, we can teach you about we that. Celebrate Hanukkah because there's we've had a couple questions, people asking, saying they don't want to get into more pagan traditions. Yeah. Um, and there's a lot of questions about Hanukkah that we've been through as well. So, yes. Um, we'll we'll do another video on that. Yeah. In the future, but nature hates a vacuum. Don't feel like you just need to like throw everything. Yeah. In the trash can. Start with the tree. Just start with the tree. See the fruit of it. Just even starting with the tree. Just get rid of your tree. 
Um, here's this, our King of the Forests. That's also um, a title of... Um, that was the title of Odin. The King of the Wood. The King of the Wood. And then also the Queen of the Wood. If we know that Asher was also... The tree was symbolic of Addis, but it was also symbolic of the female Asherah and Diana and all of the, those deities. The female deity... It, the queen of the wood that's what she that was her literal title the queen of the wood and it, the king of the wood that's not even a hard stretch because the whole point was she was androgynous and she she became man so where's jesus in all of this where is it where is jesus in the nativity Nativity scenes only caught on after Christianity was adopted by the Romans and the pagan festival of the birth of the sun. After the winter solstice was replaced with the Christian festival of Christmas, birth of the sun, most Christian art forms tend to reflect the cultural backdrop of the artists and the anticipated receptivity of the community. So, that line is just insane. Most Christian art forms tend to reflect the cultural backdrop of the artists. So what is the cultural backdrop? In Rome, it was Roman paganism. And that's where we get a lot of our images. And we're going to get into that. So here's our image of what people think is Jesus. But this image, since the dawn of man, has been Addis, Tammuz, um, whatever. And if you notice a lot of the early Christian portraits of Jesus, they are very, they portray Jesus as very effeminate and very like womanly like. So that is straight up this cult. It's not, and, and there's a reason God says, do not make graven images of me. I don't want them. We're not supposed to like, it doesn't matter what Jesus looks like. It, it, it matters what he did and what he stood for and what he said and, and how he upheld truth and justice. Um, so this here, knowing this um, iconography, that is Tammuz. And we have his cross too. So that's an emblem that we've known since for, for thousands of years to be um, a symbol of Tammuz. Also, why would, we, why would God want us to signify his son with his death? Why would he want us to resemble his son by his completely barbaric, humiliating, horrific death. Um, and so then we know that, that these winged creatures are not angels, because angels are, are described in scripture, and these are women. They're winged goddesses, so winged goddess on each side. Um, and then if you see, there's two Asherim on each side as well. Um, so there's a, a portrait being portrayed right here. And then now what we know about the red flowers, there is, is symbolic of blood. Um, the red flowers have always been symbolic of the blood of the deity. And so here we have the blood dripping and dripping from the altar right here. I mean, this is a chilling picture when you know the iconography of ancient civilizations. Um, so early Christmas nativity plays as the church's holy day dedicated to Adam and Eve falls on December 4th. So here's that reiteration that re really all Christmas was, was celebrating man's fall. Paradise plays depicting their temptation in Eden via the diabolical tempter were a common feature of Christmas season, particularly in Germany and Austria. These plays persisted into recent times, mingling with an evolving Nicholas Krampus tradition. So they brought Nicholas and Krampus in this to oh, uh, coerce people into being good. Um, the Benedict, um, Benedict Beren, Bern <laughs> Christmas play from 13th century Bavaria contains not only scenes of devils dragging King Herod off to hell, but also a ranting appearance of the Antichrist, as well as the intrusion of Lucifer into a pastoral scene in which he mocks shepherds at the nativity, claiming the angels' good tidings are lies. Um, why do we need to put that in, like, a nativity play? Why do we, what does that have to do with the birth of the Messiah? That is um, to take away from... That's to just add blasphemes to a miraculous story. 
um, where Lucifer might be omitted from a Christmas play, King Herod often stood in as earthly counterpart. So he was portrayed as Lucifer. Medieval thespians were known to take particular delight in Herod's scenery chewing fits and the king's futile attempt to eliminate his messianic rival by executing all the male newborns all was exploited all for all the pathos and terror it could summon. So instead of following the miraculous story of Yeshua's birth, they focused on Herod, Herod killing innocent children, a.k.a. child sacrifice. This histrionic blustering of actors portraying the king became such a fixture in European minds that even in Shakespeare's era, it's referenced in Hamlet's warning to overzealous thespians, not to out Herod Herod, uh, which is very comedic. Don't don't overdo it. Don't out Herod. Don't be too macabre. Uh, theatrical representations of these atrocities were not only popular with the medieval audiences, but often enthusiastically ghastly in execution. The soldiers would even proudly display their lances and swords laden with spitted corpses of children. Um, so that's extremely horrific. And people can make the argument, oh yeah, the, the Middle Ages was just a very macabre society, but so was ancient times. And this is where these traditions derived they were all so macabre all of these cults um this cultic um society is they were all extremely macabre and dark and they celebrated darkness so that doesn't that's not that's a very null and void um statement when all of this since since the dawn of man has been extremely macabre and just prettying it up doesn't um, resolve the serious spiritual issues. Um, the cattle stall at Athens, the god of wine, Dionysus, um, so this is the Greek god of the vine, of wine and drinking, was annually married to the queen. So here we have that um, male deity and the female de deity always marrying. And it appears that the consummation of the divine union, as well as the espousals, was enacted at the ceremony. Oh, baby, what's wrong? But whether the part of the god was played by a man or an image, we don't know. We learn from Aristotle that the ceremony took place in the old official residence of the king known as the cattle stall, which stood near Pyritaneum or town hall on the northeastern slope of Acropolis. The object of the marriage can hardly have been any other than ensuring the fertility of vines and other fruit trees as which Dionysus was the god. Thus, both in form and in meaning, the ceremony would answer to the nuptials of the king and queen of May. And Joseph also went up to Galilee from the town of Nazareth to Judea to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, house of bread because he was of the house and lineage of David to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn. And in the same region, there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone upon them. And they were filled with great fear. And the angel said, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in Bethlehem, city of David, a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you that you will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with an angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among those who whom he is pleased. When the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And when and they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. And when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told to them concerning this child. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told him. But Mary treasured all these things, pondering them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen 
as it has been told. Wow, you can't copy that story. You can try to copy it, but that story is beautiful. Anyway, you should do this part. Okay. So most of your Christmas accounts will subtly change even the story of Jesus, Yeshua's birth. Mm -hmm. And that's just another element where you go, not only are the rituals changed, but they actually change, change the, the imagery and the iconography yeah. of the story. First yeah. off, the birth of Yeshua could not have been in December. Yeah. The birth of Jesus could not be in December. Why? Because the shepherds would not have had their flocks out that late in the season. Mm -hmm. He, um, we're told in John that he tabernacled among us, which is a, um, a reference to the Feast of Booths, the Feast of Sukkot. Mm -hmm. So that would have been probably September, October. Mm -hmm. Just as winter started. It would not have been in the middle of winter. The, uh, the angels that came to the shepherds probably wouldn't have had wings, whereas the, the cherubim um, had wings, but those were the heavenly throne room yeah. creatures. They weren't the messengers. The malachim that were typically sent um, looked like men. Yeah. Specifically men, not women. Uh, the angels that you see over are a tree women. are all women. Winged and goddesses. They all have wings. They're the winged goddess. So if it's if it's not the star, it's the winged goddess. And they don't care if you switch back and forth mm -hmm. because ultimately they both show ownership. Yeah. Um, in Luke 2, um, verse 39, when Joseph and Mary had done everything required by the law, they returned to Galilee to their own town of Nazareth. Nazareth. The longest period of time they would have stayed in Bethlehem was up to eight days for the circumcision of Yeshua, which was in the Jer in Jerusalem at the temple, so um, they couldn't have been in um, Bethlehem at the stable when the wise men got mm -hmm. to them. The wise men got there about two years later or yeah. three years after, and you know that because it was um, in Matthew two. It says that Herod kills all the boys. Two or younger. So that's how we know so that. So from the time that the uh, Magi came and spoke to Herod and left, from what they had told him about the sign and the stars, he knew that that baby was about two years old. Mm -hmm. it w and he wiped out everyone that had been born in that period to make sure that he got him. Um, and it also specifically says in one of the accounts um, in Matthew 2, verse 10 through 11, it specifically says that the Magi came, followed the star to the um, to the home in Nazareth. Mm -hmm. So we're not going to Bethlehem at the stable where you see the three wise men show up. And it never mentions three wise men. Did you put it that just in says, here or not? Yep, it oh, says yeah. uh, there was never three wise men, but three gifts were given. It but doesn't it say how many wise the men The Osiris were. account of Osiris being born mm -hmm. says that three wise men came. So they've taken elements of the pagan version of yeah. him and they've thrown it all through the story and seeded it in. And we think, okay, well, it's not that big of a deal. It's just a detail. But they had to change the details so that they're not telling the story of Yeshua or Jesus. They're telling mm -hmm. the story of Osiris and telling you that it's the story of your Messiah. Yes, that's good. So here are, so this is just a really interesting picture. So here's three people giving homage to Ur. Um, this is um, an Akkadian seal. This is husband of Ishtar and Nana, the moon god. Um, so here they are giving homage. One, two, three. And here's the same thing. One, two, three. This is 860 eight BC to 850 BC. We have the star, like the morning star. And what do we see here? Same thing. Three giving homage to the king deity. And interestingly, in Judges, um, at the very beginning of the book, it says that the first nation that um, Israel was sold to slavery to was Mesopotamia. Mm -hmm. Because immediately after jo Joshua died, they started intermarrying with the nations, marrying their daughters, yep. and worshiping their gods. And the first captivity was eight years of servitude to Mesopotamia. 
because they were worshiping the Mesopotamian gods. Yes. So every single time God does this, it gets worse and worse and worse. And he keeps saying longer okay, captivities. Yes. Okay. If you listen, if you get what I'm saying, I'm going to back off now. Yeah. So anyway, continue. Um, so nativities throughout history. So <laughs> this one has freaking swaths. <laughs> like, <laughs> what the heck? And we know that that's also a sure bit. That's a, a yes. That's a Buddhist symbol as well. Like that supposedly means peace and divinity, but that's also an occult symbol, and it's been an occult sim- symbol. So <sighs> there are swastikas on this nativity, people. And this is also the sarcophagus. So this is like on a tomb. Um, who died in 408 CE, a Roman general. Um, so. Interestingly enough, one, two, three, three wise men, 408 CE. Um, so this one is quite interesting. So we have our wise men, and notice the star is right above the um, Virgin Queen, Virgin Mary's um, head, showing ownership and um, that they're the same image. So that is not Mary jesus's mother that is the queen of heaven this is fourth century the vatican that's found in the vatican um we have so right in between baby jesus and it's this one it's interesting it's like a corn stalk and you think about the corn god and the female and then the female big big, yes and so they're in between showing marriage and ownership and then the baby I mean, they literally put effigies of little babies if, under trees. If you look at the donkey and the bull here, yeah, they're actually coming out of the tree. You're they're, right. They're not, That's weird. So they're personifying this tree here. That's really interesting. And that's the male deity, and then it's it's very very powerful. Um, so here we also see the star also is once again aligning with the Virgin Mary. And notice that most of these nativities. Not all of them. Like this one, I guess the center would probably be Jesus. But most of them, the center is the center of this, like the star of the show is not Jesus. Here is Virgin Mary with a star above her head, a morning star, like the queen of heaven. Then we have the babies, um, then three wise men, which it never states. And again, the star is above her head. We've got 4th century Vatican, this is 5th century Athens, Greece, 4th century sarcophagus, this is in Musée de l'Art in um, Provence. So here we have some more. Um, This one, um, the star is above the baby, but still we know that the star resembles ownership. And then this man is bowing before the virgin. So it doesn't make it much better. And if you notice, there's like goats. And this looks like a pig in this um, scenery. It's quite interesting. And the grape, the grapes. Um, Here we have again the starburst. And these are called um, sun discs. And they were all all over sun worship in Rome. And they just adapted it to Christianity after Constantine... Um, adopted Christianity and and Rome in turn adopted Christianity. So there's just sunbeams over Joseph. There's sunbeams over baby Jesus, over the angels. And the angels are all women. And there's three wise men. And there's goats everywhere. And if you notice, there's two black goats. And that's interesting. Okay, this one is so creepy. The, the tree, the... Baby Jesus is coming out, sprouting out of the tree, people. And here we see the stars above the queen of heaven. It's coming out, sprouting out of the tree, people. It's so dark. It's so dark. And then we have, this is obviously, this is all about Mary. That is like, she's the star in this. And then we've got the sun disks. That's 11th century and 800 um, so then we have the winged goddesses. I'll show you some different images. Um, here we've got Artemis. I mean, that looks like an angel, like what people think an angel looks like. 
Um, we've got Nike. Nike, that looks like straight up. And she's holding a wreath. Um, that straight up looks. And this is in Ephesus as well. I forgot that. 129 BC. Um, and that looks like our modern day of what we think that angels look like. That would have been something that Paul would have been saying, heck no. Telling people, Get rid of this. Yes. Amen. And then here's the ancient Rome in bronze figurine of a winged goddess. This looks straight up like I would see this and be like, oh, that's like a nativity piece from the 1800s. If you weren't, if you didn't know any better. Um, and then here, I mean, look, there's a banner here. Like it, it's the same thing. And here's um, Ishtar, the winged deity with her wings. And this is Addis as a, as a winged figure. And that's very creepy. And that's where you get what cherubim look like, the cupids. That's not what cherubim are in scripture. And then what's the focal point? Is it Jesus or is it the star or the angel? We have the star here, the star, I mean, the angel, the winged goddess, the winged goddess, the winged goddess, the star, this one, a connect Christmas, and it boom, boom, boom. Look at that. It's all about the star and the winged goddesses. They're not even trying to hide it in that one. And then the star. It's, I mean, you, you don't even see baby Jesus in this one. He's like barely there. Like most of them, like, we don't even know where baby Jesus is in most of the nativities. They're like, where is he? He's not there. It's like, where's Waldo? He's yeah. Um, here's the star of each star. And this one is so creepy. She's holding the star. The winged goddess is holding the star. Showing ownership and the starring above. The star above. Even more creepy. So creepy. And here's the baby. And actually, I don't even see baby Jesus. So there we go again. Where's baby Jesus? Where is he? Um, here is, I mean, this is so beyond creepy too. So creepy. Here's the nativity. And then there's the star. And what, what do we think? What, what, what is it that we look at? And then what does she put here? The nativity. And then she has the star. The star was never a focal point. The star wasn't like, oh my goodness, we're worshiping the star. The star was a sign from the heavens that the Messiah had come. It was an astronomical event. It was an astronomical event. Yes. Did the Magi look at the star and they're like, oh my goodness, I need to worship that. Make sure you draw what it looks like. Make sure that everybody knows what it looks like so we can recreate this five, like 2,000 years from now. No. Um, here's the winged deity. And this, if you look at the vertical line, like I said, um, anything where it aligns, right? Not only alignment, but height. A so lot, yes. The highest point, if you look at this it, tree, This is the authority. The point is, is the, the star. Owner, and then it moves down. Yes. So all of this is in alignment. These are the same image. We've got the winged goddess, the Asherah, and the star on top. Um, this one's very interesting because there's pine cones everywhere, and that's just pine cones have always been in um, fertility rituals and in fertility like pine trees, etc. They've always been used for fertility. Um, and there's the star. The, the, this isn't really the focal point, but I just thought that was very interesting. Then we have these cherubim, which it doesn't, that's not how they look. And then we have an obelisk nativity. I cannot believe I found this. I was shocked. And what do we have on top? Like you said, who shows ownership? The winged goddess with the star and she's holding the star. People, you can't make this stuff up. Oh, it's everywhere. And, and oh yeah, the mistletoe the in the background. The and the candle. The candle like an offering. That's great. I mean, my goodness, you cannot. And notice that the calf, the cow that's in it is always a bull. It's never a, a female cow. I mean, I don't know if there's any like weight to that, but I would assume that in a stable you would want more milking cows than anything. But I don't know. I'm not a, I'm not a like a ancient civilization farmer, agriculturalist. Maybe someday. Maybe someday. <laughs> Anywho. That is just very, I mean, the symbolism here. Like, people would think you're it's crazy, dark. but when you explain it, and when you show them, hey, this is Asherah worship, how it's always that been. is how it's been. And they hide it now because you don't, they, you, we don't have the trained eye to see what those of the ancient Near East saw. But they would see this, and Paul would see this, and be like, what the heck? Yeah. The early Christians would see this and be like, oh my word, That's what is what going on? One of the prophets was 
doing? They were yes. going, what are you people doing? What is going on right now? Um, so here we have a traditional Christmas nativity, and this is considered a modern pagan nativity. They look identical, first off. We've got the Christmas tree with the moon. Moon has always been an, a fertility symbol of Asherah. And then, in most instances. yes. And then look at this. Why the heck is there <laughs> candy next to the nativity? I saw this picture and I was like, WTF? Why is there candy next to the nativity? That is an offering, people. Red flag. And people don't know this. The spirit of these these entities it works in secret it works in secret and they pull people into it oh you know what that might be a good idea to put candy next to the nativity people don't think of oh that's an offering but the demon knows that's why the demon's asking people to do these things if satan didn't get anything from this yeah he wouldn't have spread it to the entire world yes he he has to gain something for it to be worthwhile and yes. when you look and you see it everywhere you have to ask yourself, or at least I do, I can't help but ask myself, why is this so important? And yeah. Why did he Amen. go to such great lengths throughout throughout time to get everybody to doing celebrate these this? Rituals? Every single society celebrates this. Like if it almost wasn't important, we everybody, all be doing it. every country, every, I mean, everybody around the world celebrates this. And most people. I'd say a good bit of people, it's more like secular Christianity, celebrate this in the lens of worshiping Jesus. So um, Christmas rituals are worship of the idols, and we've reiterated this, but we can, we're can we just going to go forth. <laughs> just because you feel in your heart you are worshiping God through these customs does not mean you are. God commanded us not to do these rituals, which is disobeying him. Not only did he say, I don't want them, he said he doesn't like them. He hates these rituals. And in doing this, you are obeying the gods and giving them your worship. Because worship, like we, why, like we talked about with sacrifice and worship are synonymous, so are obedience and worship. Mm -hmm. Obeisance and worship are synonymous as well. So if God's telling you, do not do these things. It's all throughout scripture. Don't do the things of the ways of the nations. Even if we're going to get vague, this we've shown you enough historical evidence that this is of the nations. And so even if we said, oh, the Asherah stuff isn't accurate, even though it's completely spot on historically, um, then God would still say, don't do this. And that part we're going to prove in the next video. We're going to go into specifically, now what does God say yes. about these rituals? Because yes. it's all through the Bible when you look at the, the lens. So um, if God's telling you, don't do it, and it's all through our scripture, do not do the ways of the nations. But then the society and the world tells you, oh, no, this is pleasing to God. And you follow that. You are worshiping demons. Bottom Even line. if it's unbeknownst to you, and that's the Balaam story again. Yes. It doesn't matter if you know what's going on. If you're disobeying, that protection is taken away, and Satan has free reign to do. And it's not that you're um, judged for that. It's that you are held captive to these and rituals. And your protection is forced protect taken away. Exactly. Like God's not out to get you. But you have to be within his fence in order for him to protect. And him. we've we've said this in the first part. God in Ezekiel said, I you have driven me out of my house because of these images. Therefore, I can't even be in my own temple. How so how much more? How can he be in our homes if we put these images into our homes when God is above sickness? Also, yeah, God is above sickness. He's above death. And how are we more powerful? Who he is he he is above this, but we aren't protected from the wrong of this. And God lays out specifically: I bring you blessings and curses. If you disobey Scripture, then it's going to be the world will take you and will hold you captive. And that's exactly this: is doing these rituals will keep you enslaved in the society, enslaved in debt. How many people are in debt? How many people have stress, like insane amounts of stress and anxiety during Christmas or depression or um, fits of anger? Like 
it, the list goes on because of suicide rate suicide skyrocket. he would know he was an emt for years yeah it's dark well things happen fact. during christmas dark things happen it's, it's an emotional spell yes we're wrapped into it and we don't even realize like i it. said like we've stated it's um repetitive magic what what is, was the exact words oh sympathetic magic yeah where you're reiterating it you might not know, but you're rep you're repeating the custom. It's that kind of magic. Sympathetic. Um, Whatever. You know what I mean. L re rewind imitative, it. Imitative. Imitative magic. imitative magic. Ding ding ding. You get if a you prize. If you imitate the thing, <laughs> you're bringing it about. So therefore, yes. if you're imitating death, you're bringing death into yes. your presence, and God can't be around death. Yes. Um. So you shall. We'll reiterate this. You shall not plant. For yourself an asher of any kind of tree beside the altar of the Lord your God. And it also says, do not bring them in your homes or you will be set apart for destruction in Deuteronomy. Um, so in the summary, Christmas rituals are not only pagan, but an ancient worship of the gods Asher and Tammuz and their many names found throughout scripture. The deeper spiritual significance of these rituals are celebrating man's death and separation from God while simultaneously using magic to reverse our curse. In the next teaching, we will focus on the great heartless judgment, seeking repentance and deliverance, and how idolatry plays into end times. And it plays in big. I think a lot of people think that idols and idolatry was just a thing of the past. It was before Jesus's time. No, it is relevant today, and there's so much scripture about the last days, including in Revelation and elsewhere in the prophets, that state that there will be judgments according to these idols. So, our next um, part is come out of her, my people. So, it's about that, cleansing, repenting, demonic oppression, and then we'll also talk about the dark magic um, behind Christmas. And the... the point to remember is this is mystery babylon and also egypt mm -hmm. the the greater exodus is egypt being judged and israel being led out uh -huh, and so, being freed because we're held captive mm -hmm. so we we have to acknowledge that we're captive so that he can come and let us free that's mm -hmm. the the year of jubilee the the whole point of jesus his first and second coming mm -hmm. are to set us free and if we don't understand that we're slaves we won't walk out of the cells when the doors are opened. Amen. Yeah. So all in the, the same gods, way that the first Exodus, hold on, all of the gods of Egypt were judged with each plague mm -hmm. and it's the same cycle is going to play out again. And if we're in the way yes. we get judged with those gods. And in the way the first Exodus, like we stated the, um, the Hebrews that were leaving Egypt, they were familiar with these customs. Um, especially if the, you know, that's what the cow the golden calf was, was they were erecting a god, the goddess Isis. And so knowing that, they didn't know the context of what worship, God's worship entailed either. To the, you know, they, we're, we're lost too, but God is going to, he's in a, the process of freeing us and, and releasing us from Egypt. And that we're about to see some miracles. We're going to see some crazy things, but we're also in some hard things. But we're also going to see some miracles. And, and it says that the miracles of the end times will be like people won't even be talking about God splitting the Red Sea. That, that'll be nothing. They I won't even. Pretty crazy. Yeah. So join us and thank you for watching. And let us know what you agree, disagree, especially disagree. We love disagreements. Uh, we love you. Bye. Blessings. Good job. <laughs>